It's September 19, 2006. Will you please stand to say the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, will you please call the roll? Councilmember Barnwell? Here. Balcone? Here. Horton? Here. House? Here. Schneider? Here. Williams? Here. Mayor Bloom? Here. Item 1, proclamation declaring September 2006 as Suicide Prevention Month. This is good. You brought um, flyers and so on. Good. We've done this the last couple of years, haven't we? It's, it's a good thing. The last 12 years. Okay, I'll, I'll read and then you can <laughs> comment. <laughs> Whereas most suicides are preventable, and the number of suicides can be reduced through awareness, education, and treatment. Suicide is a public health concern, and its prevention a community responsibility. Suicide is the 11th leading cause of all deaths in the United States, the third leading cause of death among young people between the ages of 10 and 24, and the second leading cause of all injury deaths in the state of California, the second leading cause of all injury deaths in Santa Barbara County. Understanding the causes of self-destructive thoughts and behavior will reduce the rate of self-inflicted injury in our county, in our country, and encouraging at-risk persons to seek help will both save and improve the quality of countless lives. It's estimated that 4.4 million people in the United States have lost loved ones to suicide, and that many can be helped by eliminating the stigma associated with mental illness, which works against suicide prevention by discouraging at-risk individuals from seeking life-saving help. The Glendon Association's mission to save lives and help people create more meaningful lives by addressing the social problems of suicide, violence, and troubled interpersonal relationships benefits all members of our community. We are going to name, proclaim September 2006 as Suicide Prevention Month in support of the 12th annual, there you are, Suicide Prevention Forum pre presented by the Glendon Association. And we encourage all citizens to join its life-sustaining efforts to provide hope and support to those in need. So thank you for doing what you do. And there you are. Thank you. Thanks. Let me put this in. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Bloom and members of City Council for recognizing this as the community crisis that it is here in Santa Barbara. Um, we really want to appreciate the support that we've received from City Council members over the years. As Mayor Bloom had mentioned, this is the 12th year that the Glendon Association is sponsoring this free community forum. And this year we're privileged to have the mayor speaking at our event as well. So okay. I want to okay. acknowledge that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, suicide is a very big problem. People don't realize the magnitude of it until I start spewing some statistics at you. And I'm going to do this kind of slowly so that you guys can really, you and all the people watching here in our community, can let this sink in in this day and age. According to the World Health Organization, suicide, there are more deaths by suicide, more deaths by suicide than by homicide and war combined wow. worldwide. More deaths by suicide than homicides and deaths from war combined. And, you know, we see it in the news all the time, but you don't read about the 31,500 people in this country that die by suicide every year. And um, one of the things that the Glendon Association, in partnership with Santa Barbara Youth Council, and this is Tricia Bartlett from the Youth Council. Mm -hmm. She's one of the chairs, and I'm sure many of you are lucky enough to work with Tricia. And we've partnered with the Youth Council to reach out, especially to youth, but to other groups like the gay, lesbian, transgender community, seniors who are at greatest risk for suicide, and youth suicide, because as every one of you sitting here and every one of you sitting at home is aware, this has been a problem in our community. And as recently as a month ago, there was an, an attempt in North County. 
Um, and so the Glendon Association has been doing this for 12 years to bring awareness to this taboo subject. And to, we invite everyone to come. This year, we're also very fortunate to have a young man um, named John Kevin Hines, which many of you have seen on television recently because we had our forum in Santa Maria last night. We had over 200 people come That's to great. that community last night, which is why I'm a little rusty on the old speech because I was up there until 11 o'clock. But um, we are really trying to reach out to youth. And this young man, at the age of 19, jumped from the Golden Gate Bridge in a suicide attempt, and by some miracle survived and has become an advocate and an activist. And he's here to talk to our community about suicide and about, you know, that it's a, it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And I'm also going to make a very brief announcement. Uh, this was announced last night for the first time. Um, Caltrans and the Glendon Association and a number of other organizations have been working extremely hard to build barriers on the Cold Spring Bridge. And Caltrans made an announcement last night. Uh, the project has been approved oh, good. and has a budget assigned to it. So it's going forward, and we should have permanent barriers within two years. Oh, perfect. And there's a number of things starting. But I'm going to turn it over to Tricia now. And I do thank you all for your support. And I hope to see you and everyone in the community there. We're offering free continuing education credits and also school credits with Tricia, which Tricia will talk about. Okay. And we'd also like to invite you to, we have a fundraiser at Soho on um, Sunday with many local artists. And you can go to our website, www.glendon.org, for more information. Thank you okay. so much. Can you give us a time oh. and date? Oh, sorry, <laughs> Sunday, Sunday the 24th. Mm -hmm. Uh, at Soho Restaurant and Music Club, and dinner starts at 6, and the music, which is an incredible lineup, it's a singers in the round format where everyone kind of jams together as if they're in your living room, and the music starts at 7.30, okay. and you can call for prices and details. And then the seminar is oh, next sorry. week. Oh, sorry. That's yes. okay. Uh, the 27th, 27th at okay. San Marcos High School at 6.30 p.m., until okay. about 9.30 p.m. Okay. And uh, we encourage teachers, everyone who might be concerned about anyone they love to attend. Okay. Thank you very much. Trish. Thanks, Joni. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Trisha Bartlett, and I'm chair of the Santa Barbara Youth Council, and I'm just here to encourage all the teens from Santa Barbara to come out and support this event. I think it's a really important topic that we talk about, and we are offering community service hours for any students who attend. So thank you. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Appreciate what you're doing. Mr. Uh, Bernal? Yeah, I, I think it's probably appropriate for me right now to, I'm going to use the common phrase, come out of the closet, but um, when you get older, you kind of forget what it was like to be young. Particularly, I look in the mirror and I look at myself and I go, how did I get to, who is this guy? But I remember, I was in the Army when I was a young teenager, and I remember contemplating suicide. I remember that my friends had, all of my Army buddies had girlfriends. I remember that I didn't have one. And I remember thinking I was going to get run over or killed or shot. And then when I was in school, I remember not doing too well, and nobody liked me on any given day. And the thing that struck me that's making me say this out loud is because he just referred to suicide as a permanent solution to a temporary problem. I mean, the fact of the matter is that if you just let those ugly thoughts go and wait until the night is over and get up in the morning, often they disappear. But everyone that I know in their teenage years at some point felt that way. And unfortunately, some act upon it and are successful in, in, in wiping out their own life. And I, I think what you're doing is great. It is totally a taboo subject. People, I think everybody in this room, I would bet $100 that everybody in this room at some point when they were a teenager or a young adult thought about it because they thought they were being put upon or their parents didn't love them or their friends didn't like them. So I think what you're doing is really, really important, and I want to compliment you on it. I think it's an important thing. We don't want to lose our youth. They're the hope of the future. Councilmember yes. Barnwell, I really want to say how much I appreciate your 
candor and sharing that with us. It means so much for representatives of our city to do that because people feel like they are not alone when you do that. It means a great deal to us. Thank you. And I know other members have shared that too. Okay, thank you very much and thanks for coming by. Um, we have changed to the agenda, I think, Mr. Armstrong. Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, there's one change to the agenda. Item number nine, which is a notice of a council site visit next Monday. Um, we're removing that because the uh, appeal has been pulled, and so that will give you okay. an hour next Monday free. Well, party time. Okay. <laughs> and uh, public comment. First, uh, we'll hear from Kenneth Locke, followed by Elsa Granados. And then the last speaker will be Michael Self. My name is Kenneth Locke. Um, I mentioned to you before that uh, I was going to grade the, uh, the artwork on State Street. And uh, the basis of a grade is in relation to a, a gradation, uh, what each artist has in common. We can understand the grade in which they are um, occupying. Uh, from my perspective, as claiming to be a master of, of art, of fine arts, and uh, I'd have to say that uh, the grade that they're, they're in is a relatively unenlightened uh, grade. Uh, the work that they're creating is uh, dysfunctional. It's uh, meaningless, uh, temporal, uh, immature, uh, kind of the list goes on and on type of thing. Um, the, the knowledge, uh, I think some of them are teachers, the knowledge that they're sharing with their students uh, is uh, the same thing, meaningless, dysfunctional. It's, it's passing on a, a tradition of this. Um, I spoke before the Arts uh, County uh, Commission meeting, and I mentioned uh, to them the, um, the basis of the, uh, the McDonald's uh, situation. Uh, I mentioned to them that uh, in the next age, we're, we're, we're not going to have art or corporate America. And um, right now we're living in an age which, which is um, meaningless upon meaningless. And uh, what I'm bringing to the table in relation to um, this generation is the means for transcending the, the meaningless, uh, meaningless knowledge, meaningless relationships, and then uh, toning for the division uh, which, which is causing this. But... Um, I'll be speaking for the Arts Commission this week and also probably the Parks and Rec and also the school board. Thank you. Thank you. Elsa Granados, and the last speaker will be Michael Self. Hi, hey, Elsa. Good afternoon, Mayor Bloom and members of the City Council. My name is Elsa Granados, and I'm here representing Santa Barbara Rape Crisis Center. I'm the executive director of the agency, and I'm here to... Uh, let you know, if you don't already, that we've relocated. And we want to make sure to get the word out to as many people in Santa Barbara as we can, everywhere from Carpinteria to the Santa Ynez Valley, which is our service area. We want to make sure that our clients and other uh, citizens in the community uh, follow us to where we are. It's a great space. We were able to secure it and um, do the necessary tenant improvements to suit our needs because of very generous donations from uh, of materials, labor, and professional services from various trades in town. And so I'm here to invite you to a community housewarming. Uh, walking into a rape crisis center may be a little intimidating sometimes. And so um, I wanted to uh, try to convey that this is one, one way that we're trying to break down those barriers and wanted to have you as leaders of our community come and share this and open the space for all to come and uh, see it. We're very proud of it. We're very happy to be there. And so I have some invitations here. Please take a few. Okay. But you're going to want to tell the public yeah. when and where. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The community housewarming will be occurring on September 28th from 4 to 7 at 433 East Cañón Perdido. And 
uh, where we occupy the lower uh, floor. It's a building on the corner of Olive and Canyon Perdido next to the State of California building across its parking lot. Uh, so we're going to be there. We have, um, we're going to have some yummies for the tummy and <laughs> also the UCSB uh, Middle Eastern Ensemble is going to Good. be performing. So some music Good. that you can wiggle your tummy to. Uh, but in any case, uh, I hope that you will join us. And also while I'm here and in relation to uh, a previous uh, speaker regarding suicide prevention, uh, sexual violence affects uh, its, uh, its targets in many ways, primarily women. And uh, sexual violence survivors are 30 t 13 times more likely to um, contemplate suicide than someone in the general public. So I really appreciate the Glendon Association's uh, work. Uh, we certainly work very closely with them. And so I appreciate your acknowledgement of them today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michael Self will be the last speaker. Thank you, Mayor and Council, for the opportunity to speak. Um, the city, rightfully so, is putting a lot of energy and effort into making the city as pedestrian friendly as possible. And there, I think, is one obvious thing that is being overlooked by our public work and uh, traffic division, and that is the condition of the sidewalks themselves. Um, I don't know if maybe a graffiti type hotline for areas, because I know they can't be everywhere. Um, I walk over an hour every day and I try to avoid those places that have the broken sidewalks. I have fallen several times. I guess I am fairly resilient because nothing has really come of it. But for uh, the aged or just a matter of circumstance, it, it can be damaging. So I would just suggest a, a better wait for the division to know where the crumbling sidewalks are. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Madam Mayor? Yes. Go ahead, Mayor um, I keep with me the um, pothole hotline. I'm glad for her coming up, uh, for myself coming up and mentioning it. The number is 897-2630. And I want people to know about that because it, it can uh, relieve or, or avoid some kind of unsafe situation sometimes. That works not just for streets but also for sidewalks. Sidewalks and street repairs, and it's yeah. uh, and again, it's for the public safety, just as the speaker was mentioning. Okay, okay, good. Is that twenty nine thirty or twenty six thirty? Eight nine seven two six three zero. <laughs> we have a flipping problem here. <laughs> Potlucks are potholes are. Us. They're amazingly responsive. They yeah, really they are. are. They've they done. Are. They've, I've, when I've reported them, I've been really surprised at how quickly they've gotten out there. They are. Okay, um, Mr. Horton. This is uh, Council Member Committee Assignment Reports. Mr. Well, thank you, Madam Mayor. It was a uh, really uh, interesting and great weekend. Um, I wanted to comment on the Chalk for Peace event uh, that was done down at Cabrillo Boulevard. The kids uh, did a wonderful job on their little um, uh, peace uh, symbols, and I hope that's uh, the first, first annual event for that one. Um, there was a, an event at the Polo Grounds put on by the Carpinteria Arts Council called Pallet to Pallet, and that was a, um, an event to raise money for the Carpentry Arts, and it was great to see so many people turn out and to raise uh, the kind of money they did down there for that. And uh, former Mayor Weinberg uh, was involved with that. Uh, many of us, I think all of us, were at the um, Fund for Santa Barbara Bread and Roses event at Rockwood, and that always is one of the best uh, events of the weekend and indeed the entire year. And then finally, yesterday, I spent most of the day um, in scenic Guadalupe, uh, attending the first five commission meeting. And our commission is concerned with the, um, the health, welfare, family life, and school preparedness for the children of our entire county under the age of five. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I'm afraid to call on Ms. Schneider. <laughs> she, she was there, Mayor Pro Tem this weekend, and I was off on a trip, and she 
Really, I think that was the busiest uh, weekend in months and months and months and months. Saturday was definitely busy. She took there were seven on, events so. I attended Saturday, and uh, I don't know how you do that weekend in you and out. You just keep running. You don't you you say just hi, said, goodbye. You pace hi, yourself. Goodbye. Yeah. Um, also, thank you, Madam Mayor. Also uh -huh. mentioned after Chalk for Peace, uh, there was uh, Looking Good Santa Barbara had an Adopt the Block program. There were a few of us there that... People coming in and out, learning about graffiti abatement. There were these. There's actually, if you if you call or email Looking Good Santa Barbara, uh, you can get a take home graffiti abatement kit, the toolkit, and it has everything, all the stuff you need to go around your neighborhood and and wipe things off right away. And certainly, always call the graffiti hotline if you see anything. I actually have that number on my cell phone, but my cell phone's not here, so I can't. Uh, Say the number. Maybe Grant has it. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> not on you. <laughs> uh, so that happened. Um, also, uh, CPA, uh, Citizens Planning Association, had their Sandcastle contest, and I think there were 28 different teams. Um, and I know another council member was one of those. You might want to describe that one when it comes <laughs> to you. I was invited to speak at the Surfrider Foundation second annual paddle out. For it's deal uh, talking about ocean pollution. Um, Congress member Lois Capps. Uh, Assemblymember Pedro Nava, Supervisor Carbajal, and I were there to greet the paddlers before they went out for their for their paddle out. And the uh, channel keepers had their channel swim also on on Saturday and uh, had a big barbecue at Galita Beach. Um, they actually got there earlier than expected, so it, w it was windy on on Saturday, but they they were able to pull that through. Uh, so yeah, Saturday was. And then I had a birthday party to go to or something like that. So it was, it was a great long day. Um, I'm very pleased also yesterday the uh, Leadership Council for the 10-Year Plan to End Chronic Homelessness unan unanimously adopted its plan. Wow. Uh, that's a big milestone. The next steps now is to start the public comment, public hearing process starting with the Board of Supervisors uh, in October, and then it'll come to us probably late October, early November. We're trying to, there's a transition team I'm part of that we're trying to uh, work out those details as it goes through the system. The uh, I have to give real kudos to uh, Jeanette Kandow and the County Housing and Community Development um, and uh, Kathleen Boschke who put together a 20-page sort of Reader's Digest version. The full plan is over 200 pages and this is only 20 pages and it's still in draft form but uh, will soon be out for lots of copies around for people to look at and get a real sense of what the plan is all about. Um, and finally last Friday the three different uh, advi homeless advisory committees, the South Coast Advisory Committee on Homelessness, the Lompoc one and the one in Santa Maria, all came together in Lompoc, and there were about 40 people there who just basically to share ideas about what's happening in their geographic area in relation to homelessness to talk about the 10-year plan process. Uh, and we hope to do that on either a quarterly or semi-annual basis uh, and rotate around each site and perhaps even go to um, a new look, new facility or something like that as we go. So busy week, to say the least. Thank you. Well, thanks for filling in. That was good. Good on my part <laughs> to have you do that. Uh, Mr. Williams. Uh, well, Saturday was pretty busy. Um, seven events too, so there must have been a couple other ones too. Uh, uh, the um, uh, including, uh, I have to congratulate our our staff. I got to join them at the uh, zoo for the United Way Day of Caring, um, uh, and we um, uh, the uh, fire department staff in particular were cleaning up all the um, loose leaves um, with near near the kitty train, uh, and a number of public works staff. Uh, digging ditches um, in, um, uh, nice. uh, in and around uh, the, uh, the, the zoo. And so between that and shoveling sand in the sandcastle event, um, I was very sore after this weekend. <laughs> um, but I do have to tell you that uh, my team, by some miracle, the uh, Friends of Coal Oil Point, got a second prize for Ooh. one of the categories in the um, uh, uh, sandcastle contest. That was a, a fundraiser by Citizens Planning Association. Um, yeah, and uh, the channel swim was uh, came in early, but that was because they couldn't do all the channel with the surf swell in. So what's good for us oh, surfers was not good for why. the swimmers. <laughs> um, and uh, the um, uh, in addition to our crazy uh, Saturday and crazy weekend, uh, yesterday um, uh, Councilmember Schneider and myself attended the Ladera Group, which is a group of okay. uh, residents on one of. Uh, you know the more challenging streets um, of our of our city, uh, and we were pleased to give them 
uh, some direction on how to uh, um, they could uh, uh, use their energy in trying to intersect with kids that are at risk for uh, gangs and get them in some kind of sports activity um, with the Lower West Side um, Advisory Group uh, and some uh, pleased to report to them some progress on getting street lamps and lights uh, replaced. And uh, I brought them one of those graffiti uh, removal kits so oh, that they can take graffiti into their yeah. own hands. Um, and last week, uh, Councilmember Horton and myself attended what was really an exciting event um, about um, you know, about uh, some amazing stories of recovery for brain injured children. And uh, this can cover a, a wide range of um, uh, of defined um, problems, whether that's recovery from a stroke if you're a young child, acute dyslexia, what's referred to as mental retardation, um, uh, uh, acute uh, ADD. Um, uh, all of these are, are really challenging problems for parents, but um, there is a foundation in town that um, uh, pr offers some aid and has had some great uh, progress, uh, the Turner Foundation. So if you're at home and you know somebody who uh, suffers from that, uh, particularly if they're a child, um, you want to uh, maybe look up the Turner Foundation or call my office. Okay, very good. Mr. Bernal? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, m many of those things that were mentioned, we all attended. I, uh, I wanted to also t say that I attended the Harbor Merchants meeting last week. There will be a new president, and there will also be a festival of food and festivities, uh, the date of which I have actually forgotten. I wrote I it down right something. somewhere, and I've lost that piece of paper. But next week I will give it to you. promises to be an awful lot of fun. I wanted to say that um, the graffiti, graffiti removal kits, uh, one of the things that Looking Good Santa Barbara is, is hoping to find is someone in, who will take responsibility for their block. So I have taken responsibility for two blocks. And actually, I haven't used my graffiti removal kit. I've just used a can of uh, frizzy white shadow paint. And I've just gone around and painted over this graffiti. And I've been doing it for about three months. And at first, it was about every two weeks that I did this. And I haven't done it in 30 days. So I think some of the uh, philosophy on this topic is actually true. If you continuously paint it out, then it just doesn't show up anymore. Um, and then lastly, I don't know how many people know, but the entire city council met with the planning commission this morning and, and talked about some of the most important things to face the city in the next 50 years. And that will be replayed Sunday morning at 9 and Friday, I believe, at 7 on our city channels. So if anyone is interested in development of La Cumbre Plaza and downtown and Milpas and the waterfront and the roads and the housing and all those very important topics, I would suggest that you watch that on uh, the city TV. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It was a good meeting. Ms. Falcone. Well, everything's been said practically, except I did want to mention that the Bread and Roses, they hit a milestone with their fundraising event this year. They hit $100,000 as a fundraiser, oh, which is really extraordinary. Thinking back 20 some odd years, 25 years, 26 years, when this fund started and uh, how small it was and uh, the dedicated folks to hit $100,000 at a fundraiser is really quite something. So I wanted to applaud them publicly. And um, yesterday, I'm sure I joined many, many other hundreds, maybe thousands of people in uh, taking off the measurable layer of ash that mm -hmm. was settled on every single thing in my house that had a surface. So I didn't attend anything yesterday. I was cleaning my house. So. <laughs> Thank you. I came to my car, which was sitting in the airport for two days, and I couldn't see out the windshield. I thought, who did this? And then I found out it was a fire. So, um, Yeah, I spent, well, last Thursday I uh, hosted the... Um, Urban Water Council, which is a group of mayors from all over the United States. They came here to talk about water issues. They ended up talking a lot about climate issues because it's all intertwined. Um, but they all love Santa Barbara, so that was kind of fun. And then on Friday, the leadership group from the Conference of Mayors was here, so and that's another about 30 mayors. And uh, they all love Santa Barbara, too. So, you know, that, that part is fun. And it's fun to walk down the street and see the mayor of Providence, Rhode Island. And I invited him in to City Hall on Saturday. It's just, it, that's a fun thing to see other mayors because they have the same issues. You know, they all have problems with affordable housing. They're having problems with um, all, uh, gangs and graffiti. And uh, so the discussion is there. But the main thing on their calendar of, of, of the Conference of Mayors for this coming year is going to be um, the, the climate change and uh, global warming. Um, 
as my friend Rocky Anderson from uh, Salt Lake City said, the lack of bold visionary leadership at, at the uh, federal level is why the local mayors are doing what we do. And 296 of us now have signed on to the Climate Change Agreement. I know we did that last year. We approved it here. We have a sustainability committee, and we're really on a roll here doing a lot of things. But um, anyway, that was good. And then 37 of us ended up in Alaska on Saturday, and we spent two days looking at um, what's going on up there. And if that's a barometer, I'll tell you, if that's a barometer for what's happening in this country in the future, we are in deep trouble because the permafrost is melting. And there, I sat last night at a dinner uh, next to a mayor from, um, I wrote it down because it's very difficult, Shishmarov is the name of the, it, it's, it's an um, Alaskan native village, you know, and, and these are natives. That village has been in the same place for over 4,000 years, and they're going to have to move it. And the reason they are is it's been on permafrost. They don't have grocery stores like we do. They go out and do their hunting. They put it in the, like what would be the basement they have, you know, in the permafrost. That keeps it cold all year round. They don't have the permafrost anymore. And a third of their village has already disappeared, uh, sunk into the, into the um, water. And um, he was talking to us as if we could help him. And all we could do, and we all signed on to a petition to ask the federal government, they need $200 million to move this village. Then we found out that's not the only village. There's probably a dozen such villages up in the Arctic. So um, we're in deep trouble. And uh, this, this council is already working on sustainability. We need to keep doing that. But the issues of flooding, sea level rise, and, you know, we're a coastal community. Um, and an increase in fires. We talked about that. We went and talked to the Anchorage Fire Department. Um, and then I come back and find all this ash. You know, it's kind of, uh, but an increase in fires around the United States, it's a big deal for our city because we send our firefighters off and our, our resources are headed for that. So it's very serious, but we really need to work on this. So I will probably, um, I think I'm going to make a presentation to the uh, Sustainability Committee, and then we'll see where we can go with that. We have our... Um, you know, Nina Johnson's doing a good job on sustainability, but but I am definitely uh, I'm, I've now been a, a appointed to a, a a national committee on on climate change. The mayor's it's MCCP Mayor's Climate Change something with a P <laughs> program policy something like that, um, and so that's what is going to occupy me over this coming year because it's very important to our coastal community. Um, I have a note from Grant House. Santa Barbara Graffiti Hotline is 897-2513. Good for you. Good for you. So you will be hearing more. I don't want to spend any more time on that right now. Um, coast, uh, consent calendar, anything, anybody want to take off? Um, I would like to pull number five for number about five, eight okay. seconds. Number five, okay. Anybody else? Okay, I think that would be the only one you need to read. Susan, go ahead. Item 5, fund transfer for Yananali Street in lieu undergrounding project. Oh, okay. Mr. Barnwell? I, Dale Carnegie says that the sound we all most love to hear is the sound of our own name. And uh, I, I have to believe it's probably true of everyone. So I wanted to say the name of the woman who is responsible for this, Loretta Red. Sat oh. on, sits on the Water yeah, Commission, right. and this passed in front of her, and she was concerned about why that's we right. were doing it. And her questions to me, and I think other council members, led to this discussion, and we have now been able to allocate three, which is a, not a small amount of money, three hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars to undergrounding in other areas in the waterfront. And we all know how important that is. And I just wanted to give Loretta a pat on the back and for having done that. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay, no questions for Mr. Ferguson? Darn. Okay, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> okay, anybody You'll else? We'll have more later. Mr. Horton. I uh, move consent calendar. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Very good, thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, we are to item 10, I believe. Report from the Finance Committee. There you go. Mr. Hart. Finance Committee met today at 1230 and reviewed two items, which will be reported out later in this meeting today. Thank you, Susan. Okay, now item 10. 
update on performance management program and fiscal year 2006 department performance highlights. Mr. Armstrong. Yes, Madam Mayor, members of the council, um, it's, great, it's a great pleasure for me to give you our annual report on uh, city's results on our performance management program. Uh, what I'll do today is I'll start out the presentation and give you an overview of our system and how it works. Uh, talk about some of the results of the, in the broad picture, and then I'm going to ask Nina Johnson, who's really headed up this program, to go over in some specific areas um, uh, that were um, in the various departments this year. So first let me give you a little overview of our performance management program. Uh, this program was initiated uh, three years ago, so this is the end of our third fiscal year, and it's, it's a comprehensive, systematic way to do long-term planning and prioritize our work. Uh, we have integrated it into the budget. Uh, we have a quarterly review process now where all the departments report quarterly, uh, and we tie it into all of the performance plans for every manager and department head in the city. I can tell you in talking with other cities literally throughout the country, we have probably integrated our program as well into our systems as any city I know. It's really, oftentimes these programs are done in isolation and we, I think, have really, even though it's taken us a little more time, we really tried to integrate it into the way we do work on an ongoing basis. Another key part of our program was the attempt to try and shift responsibility down into the organization. And so we have a series of supervisory employees and sometimes even lower than supervisory lead persons who we call program owners who actually manage the day-to-day -day operations of about 140 different programs in the city. Um, one of the goals is to develop a, an environment that encourages continuous improvement in organizational learning. Uh, a part of that is the LEAP program, which uh, is really an offspring of this. But it's really every year to look at what we're doing, look at our results, and try and get better. Uh, another goal is to try and align the individual programs with the goals that are established by the city council so that there's, a, there's continuity and we're trying to be consistent throughout the organization. And then also we want to be able to communicate both to you as the policymakers and also the community uh, the results of the program and also come to you every year and have you help us prioritize uh, the allocation of resources into these various programs. Uh, a key to this program is the participation by employees way down in the organization. And I think uh, uh, Nina Johnson's worked with a group of what we call them as the P3 advisors in each one of the departments who give her advice, but more importantly, give advice to the program owners on how they develop the, the goals and objectives within their program. And also they work on, on how to measure certain things. Some things that we do are very difficult to measure. And so we go out and we talk to other cities and then they come back and give that advice to the departments. Our goal is to have um, ambitious but achievable objectives. Uh, you'll see we don't reach 100% of our objectives. If we did, it would probably be too easy and we're not trying hard enough. So we try and be ambitious and we also encourage risk taking in the organization. As I said before, we have frequent review um, and reporting. Um, and then we're also flexible. If things happen mid-year and a department comes to me and says, we need to change where we're going uh, because the council decided to do the Upper State Street study, or uh, something's happened in the community, then we need to change those and we need to have that flexibility. Uh, the cycle that we use uh, for the P3 program is that as a part of the budget process, each program owner comes up with a set of objectives and measurements um, for incorporation in the budget. Um, as a part of the adoption of the annual budget, then the, the council also adopts those performance measures. And as I said earlier, we have quarterly status reports that the departments submit. We now have an online system where they can present those, they can put those results online. And then we give you reports on, an, on a biannual basis. Um, and then I've just completed my reviews of the department heads, and a part of that review is uh, how well they did on their P3 objectives. And of course, before they meet with me, they've already met with all of the managers within their respective departments to go over how well they did. Um, a key part of the program is training. Uh, we've done extensive training uh, throughout the, the city organization on how to come up with good objectives, how to analyze the data and program cost. Um, a key element of the program right now is working with other cities and trying to benchmark with other cities. Um, we look at our, our program budgets and the financial reports, and we have various teams that are involved. 
Um, some of the results we've seen in kind of the macro scale is we've seen a real enhanced um, uh, service delivery and improved organization efficiency. Uh, one of the things that we do is uh, emphasis on service and lots of customer satisfaction surveys. Almost every department of the city does some type of satisfaction survey on a regular basis. Um, we've had improved project management. You'll notice in the budget we have a lot of objectives about project milestones and hitting milestones and how we do not only construction projects but also implementation projects for things like software and new program development. Um, and I think we've also gotten a better understanding even in the organization about how we allocate resources. Um, we have folks tracking results on a regular basis. And again, what's been real refreshing for me is to see folks way down to the organization looking at results now, not just at senior management, but even you know, the sewer lead worker going over the results with his employees and, um, and an adoption of different ways in different departments. Um, there's also been a shift towards more collaborative decision making. Um, at first, I think each department would come up with their own individual goals and objectives, and then they realized that they couldn't achieve their goals and objectives without working with another department, in some cases two or three departments. Uh, a couple of good examples of what I call a, a, this collaborative approach is the Neighborhood Improvement Task Force, which, as you know, for the last couple of years has really put an emphasis on trying to clean up neighborhoods, and those are projects that involve police, they involve fire, they involve community development, they involve public works. Uh, they involve outside agencies like the railroad and Caltrans. Um, another one is the green team, where, again, you've got literally representatives from almost every department. And we've seen improved teamwork between various departments. I think employees have also gained a better understanding of, the, of their mission and how they fit into the, to the big picture, um, and, and we continue to see that. In terms of our results and on the macro scale, we had 799 separate performance objectives throughout the city programs. We achieved 633 of those, which is 79%. In my plan, I was, my goal was to hit 80, so I missed it by 1%. <laughs> um, and we're up a little bit from last year where, where we had reached 78%. Don't hold it against me too much. <laughs> uh, one, of the, ten demerits for him right now. one of the things that we also started doing in this past year is looking at some citywide management indicators, and we're going to continue to expand these. Uh, but we, we developed a reporting system out to all of the, the program owners of information on sick leave, lost hours due to injury, performance evaluations completed on time, and we send that information out on a regular basis. And you'll see from the numbers, one of the things that, one of the philosophies behind this, when you start measuring things, it's amazing the results that you start to see. And you'll see, I think, in the last couple of years, because we've highlighted some of these areas, that we've seen significant increase or improvements in efficiency. Go ahead. Um, this is hours due to injury in the city. And you'll see over the last two years, we've gone from 40,000 down to 28,000 hours. So that's a reduction of about 30%. Uh, that's uh, 12,000 hours. That's the equivalent of over six person years uh, where we now have people working where before they were injured. Amazing. It really is amazing. Yeah. Uh, likewise, average sick leave per employee has dropped from 82 hours in fiscal year 04 down to 68 hours in fiscal year 06. So it's a reduction of 17%. Uh, we saw preventable vehicle collisions decrease by 7%, and we've also seen our employee training go up. Uh, we had an average of 10 hours attended in fiscal year 05, and it went up to 13 hours in 06. Uh, you can see that's a major investment in training in the organization, and I can tell you in general it's been well received. We still have some improvements to make there, uh, but it's a, very, it's, uh, it's a good way of how we reinvest in our employees. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Nina. Nina has taken a whole series of highlights from the various departments and put them in several categories to try and focus on different areas of the city. And I do want to just, you know, publicly commend Nina on the job she's done on this program. Uh, we, I gave her some broad objectives on this. And together with a group of uh, very dedicated employees, they put uh, meat in the bones on this um, and really created a, a system that I think we're all very proud of and, I, and really is one of the best I've seen in any city in the United States. So, Nina? That's great. Ms. Uh, Falcone, did you have a question? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Just before you uh, 
transition a little bit. If you in the um, our, the slide where we have lost hours due to injury, mm -hmm. can can you is is there any one department where that falls into? Is that across the board? Could you maybe split that out a little bit, please? Our major areas of a reduction, as I recall, are in the police department and in public works this last year. But so what does the the 06, what what does that represent in terms of departments over, you know, for the most part? The, is it still police Again, and public works? it's police and public works and fire, a little bit in waterfront, but not too much. Generally, where you get it is where we have people in very physically demanding jobs. Uh, you know, when we talked to you about the tasers, you may recall that one of the, really one of the selling points, I think, on the taser program was the number of injuries we had on police officers when they were involved in fights, and we're hoping to even see this go down So it would be interesting to see what, what having the tasers on the force actually does to exactly. that number. Mm -hmm. That's good. The, the other thing that, that, that's a big part of this also is, is that risk management has implemented a very aggressive light duty program so that when people are injured on the job, we now bring them back as soon as possible into um, light duty jobs that, where they, they do productive work. And um, it also gives them a, an added incentive to get back to their regular job. Yeah. That's right. Okay, Ms. Uh, Johnson. Thank you, Jim. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council Members. I'm very excited to be here today to provide an overview of some of the performance highlights from fiscal year 2006. Um, as Jim mentioned, we had 633 objectives achieved last year, so it's a big list to pull from. Uh, but we did our best in the attachment in the Council Agenda Report, and uh, just with limited time, we're going to focus on uh, even a smaller selection of those. And we pulled the selection together of highlights just so everyone could see the different ways that staff uh, is working on efficiency and effectiveness in their various programs, so, because there's so many different categories of improvements, really. Um, before I'd like to begin also, I, I would like to echo Jim's comments in that there are many, many staff who work on the P3 program and coordinating it, uh, developing their annual plans, monitoring their performance. Uh, a lot of hard work uh, goes into the program, and we really appreciate all their work and their commitment. Looking at uh, our first category, improved financial management, um, the land development team uh, basically uh, analyzed and updated their costs and fees uh, so that they would have accurate revenue projections uh, to reach cost recovery goals. Um, in the finance department, 100% uh, of insurance billings were reconciled within 30 days of receipt. Uh, from the company, and this was a result. Of, as a result of that, the city received 47,000 in billing credits. Looking at new revenue uh, that came into the city, the police department was awarded a $123,000 grant from the California Office of Alcoholic Beverage Control, and a $286,000 uh, grant for DUI enforcement from the Office of Traffic Safety. Uh, in parks and recreation. Rental revenue exceeded the budgeted revenue by $20,000 from the Chase Palm Park Recreation Center and by almost $9,000 from Casa, Casa Las Palmas. In terms of improved data tracking, uh, the Information Systems uh, Division was able to expand the data warehouse. Uh, and this was a, a really important thing in that it helps employees access their pay and benefit information online. And that was completed just at the end of the fiscal year. Um, in the building maintenance area, staff finished populating a building asset management system to comprehensively track assets in all general fund facilities. Looking at uh, ways that we've reduced our costs uh, in the waterfront department, they have reduced the cost to audit percentage rent leases by 18%. Uh, the way they did this is they decided to not uh, audit certain lease agreements where the revenue uh, was not really high enough to generate percentage rent. And as a, as a result of that, they've saved over $30,000 a year, and that will be an ongoing savings. Um, under the, uh, with the support of the risk management uh, division, the use of modified duty placements increased, and this reduced temporary total disability payments by 282000 Looking at improved service to the public, uh, in the Community Development Department, staff assisted in the future development of 51 units of affordable housing, and this is attributed to the approval of financing for the Mental Health Association, Association Project. 
in the libraries. Um, as you know, uh, year to year, we're looking at our science and technology collection uh, and keeping it within seven, uh, we want it to be seven years or old, seven years old or less. Um, this year, we saw that rise uh, a little bit more in each library. 42% in the Santa Barbara Library, and then 39% in the county branches. And staff is looking at these goals in terms of weeding, the older books, and the new purchases each year. In terms of preventative maintenance uh, in public works, 99% of preventative maintenance services of the city's motor pool was completed on schedule. And as a result, uh, in service time for sedans, fire pumpers, police cars, trucks, and loaders, for those particular classifications, uh, they were in operation uh, 92 to 98 percent of the time. Um, also in public works, preventative maintenance of the combined communication center at the police department was completed so that the center was at 100 percent operational readiness at all times and no outages were reported. Looking at project management, this is an important area in a number of departments, uh, getting projects done on time and within budget. Uh, looking at the airport, change orders for airport capital improvement projects were limited to an average of 2% of the total value of construction contracts. That's a very significant accomplishment. 100% uh, of major milestones were achieved for environmental and project review of city projects. Uh, and this is in community development. 84% um, of the minor capital projects at the waterfront were completed within budget. And minor capital projects, uh, those refer to projects of a value of $100,000 or less. In terms of accuracy of some of the information that we provide, payroll staff and finance process the biweekly employee payroll accurately and timely, 99. 9% of the time, uh, they're able to take that out a few decimal places, uh, and they're maintaining <laughs> great performance there. And we're, we're all appreciative of that. Uh, waterfront parking kiosks maintained a cash drawer accuracy rate at 99.9%. Also, um, it's based on information from each attendant-based parking lot. Timeliness is something that we focus on a lot in a number of service areas, looking at how quickly we're able to turn around certain types of requests uh, and process things. 100% of building inspections in the building division uh, were completed on the day scheduled. Um, uh, the next highlight is from Human Resources uh, with a significant increase in staff turnover. And we saw a staff turnover rate go from about 6% to over 10% uh, in this last year. Staff was able to maintain the processing time for of their external recruitments, and they were able to keep that within 43 working days. Uh, this is a significant one also in that applications rose 50%, uh, and the number of recruitments that were conducted uh, rose significantly. Uh, in the fire department, uh, while emergency call volume rose by 11%, uh, fire staff was also able to maintain an average response time of four minutes or less. Looking at excellence in public outreach and marketing, uh, Parks and Recreation Department was really a star in this area. Uh, there were a number of different strategies they used to uh, get the word out on their services and programs. One example, a midwinter parks and recreation activity brochure was published to reach new participants, uh, and that's in between the publications of their biannual activity guide. Um, and they've seen a number of their program enrollments rise. Uh, in the police department, three citizen academies were conducted in English and Spanish for 57 participants. Um, and this is really to help the public learn about uh, what goes on in the police department, and they get weekly presentations from different members of the, of the department. In terms of program participation, we've seen increases in, in a few areas. Uh, again, going back to parks and recreation, the, the RAP program, recreation after school program registrations increased by 84% to 288 participants. <laughs> um, in the library, also um, each year the county libraries are seeing uh, gains in their circulation. Uh, it's two percent, but each year it, it keeps rising. Uh, and this year they reached 843,000 items checked out. I kids don't read anymore. Uh, we talked about a little bit earlier customer various customer satisfaction surveys conducted, uh, and throughout a number of our departments we conduct surveys to both to our customers, both internal, our employees, and also our uh, external customers, the public. Um, in Parks and Recreation, uh, they do a number of surveys in a number of their programs, and 
they look at the survey information that comes back and make adjustments and improvements to those services, those classes. Um, and here's an example of where that has paid off. In the adult classes, 100% of the survey respondents uh, rated their classes as good to excellent. Um, in terms of uh, custodial services in public works, uh, staff surveyed the city facility representatives in our facilities, and they received an 88% satisfaction rating on cleanliness in our city facilities. Training for employees is key. We've mentioned LEAP a few times. Uh, one interesting workshop that was conducted earlier in the year from finance was uh, helping in finance helping the employees understand their budget and how to analyze spending during the fiscal year. Um, in addition to LEAP training, there's, there's a lot of different types of training that's uh, conducted. Uh, fire and police, uh, they do a lot of training uh, for safety. Uh, the fire department, they completed 20,000 hours of safety training, and with a goal to reduce the injuries and lost time, fire operations lowered their lost hours due to injury by 19% last year. This is a new category, environmental leadership. Um, staff developed in community development a green building incentive program uh, to encourage private development to plan for LEED certification. Um, in finance, staff published their annual consolidated, their CAFR report electronically, consolidated annual financial reports, and that reduced paper use and printing expenses. In the waterfront, uh, the waterfront department just received a clean marina certification, and they became one of four public marinas in the state to be certified. Uh, staff formed a school district recycling committee uh, to implement recycling programs on various school sites. Uh, this resulted in an increase in recycling and a district cost savings of 10000 per month uh, during the summer months. That's wonderful. Um, an employee survey was conducted to determine transportation modes and interest in flex work schedules uh, and, and looking at an assessment of different types of positions that uh, can use flex flexible schedules. Uh, this resulted in a new citywide flex work program in February 2006. Um, and since that time, some preliminary numbers have shown almost a 16% increase in the use of flexible schedules. In the forestry uh, area in parks and recreation, uh, the forestry staff were able to exceed their target for uh, planting trees, new trees. 321 trees were planted. A number of our P3 objectives are related to how well, uh, how well our services uh, adhere to state and federal and regional guidelines. Um, looking at the airport, uh, no deficiencies were noted during their, the airport's annual FAR Part 139 airport certification inspection, and that's conducted by the FAA. Mandated inspections uh, for hazardous mater materials facilities uh, were met and exceeded, uh, the pr they met and exceeded the pres prescribed schedules, and that was completed in the fire department. Um, looking at the use of technology, Library website resources were expanded this year to include local book discussion groups. So there are, there's even more information on the library website. Uh, that's a website, that part of the city's website has hit uh, quite a bit. In the police department, the CompStat program was fully implemented and integrated with the city's P3 program. Um, this next portion is just looking at overall, just some of the key, some key projects that were completed. Uh, the Wildland Fire Benefit Assessment District uh, was approved by the residents in the foothill and extreme foothill areas. Police headquarters uh, was remodeled, new lobby and records area. Ortega Park improvements were completed, and they were completed on time and within budget. Uh, another project uh, coming in under budget, Louise Lowry Davis Center. Uh, that renovation was completed also, 100000 under budget. Uh, Creeks had a great year uh, in terms of their capital improvement projects and public education efforts. Uh, they made a lot of progress on $6 million of capital improvement projects, uh, completion of two stormwater, stormwater diversion facilities, uh, that's Hope Avenue and Haley Street, uh, completion of the design of two large-scale stormwater management systems, uh, the Las Positas and Old Mission Creek, and they also initiated construction of the Oreo Borough Restoration Project and Westside Ultraviolet Light Treatment Facility. Sheffield Water Quality Project was also completed um, at the waterfront. Interior dredging between the breakwater and Marina One uh, was completed in, uh, at the end of June. Um, and then at the golf course, uh, the second phase of their safety improvement plan also was completed within budget. 
So we've also pulled together a list of uh, other objectives that were not completed. Uh, we went through some of the one, uh, selection of ones that were completed and uh, just to show a number of other uh, objectives that were not met this year, areas for us to improve. Um, this is a list of objectives not met, one from each department. In administrative services, um, the 90% goal of completing personnel evaluations on time wasn't met. Uh, but we're approaching the goal, and this year we reached 86%. Um, airport capital program milestones reached a, uh, reached only 56% on-time completion um, instead of the 75% goal. And that's really just due to uh, unreal, unrealistic time frames. And even in this current year, they're looking at how they can plan out their milestones better uh, for each year. Community development uh, wasn't able to complete a zoning ordinance uh, package on time due to other project priorities coming up during the year. In the finance department, uh, we weren't able to complete the infrastructure asset capitalization by June 30th. Uh, there was a deadline on June 30th, but this project, or most of the project was completed by that point, but it will be complete um, by September. So by the end of this month, uh, we should be done with that. The library circulation, uh, and this is in the main libraries, dropped by 0.5%, uh, and it was reportedly due to patron concerns over parking and uh, increased uh, issues with homelessness. Um, in the parks and recreation, golf course usage, uh, what they weren't able to meet their goals in terms of the, the number of rounds of golf, uh, and this was due to a second year of heavy winter rainfall. Um, in the police department, um, we didn't complete the purchase of, of an integrated records management system. This is a system that's needed uh, so that it's integrated in all of the police uh, department systems. Uh, but they are moving forward on that this year and they're evaluating different systems and costs now. Uh, Public Works Engineering uh, was unable to maintain the capital cost estimates within 10% of final costs. Uh, and this is due, due to construction cost inflation and job market problems. Um, and then finally, Waterfront uh, wasn't able to process 90% of requests for slip trades and transfers within 10 days. And this was due to a significant demand during the summer months. And then at the same time, they had moved uh, their building to the new, new building. Just on the, you didn't mean that 90% were not met. They just didn't meet the goal of 90%. Right. right. So okay. that's, that's correct. A little that's different. The goal that's correct. Of, yeah. yeah. They came close. Um, now looking at next steps for our program, um, we've come a long way. We've completed our first or our third full year in the P3 program, so staff will continue to fine tune our objectives and measures as part of our long term program. Um, as uh, we had mentioned earlier in terms of our sustainability program, um, we are going to be tying that in a little bit uh, this year as we plan for our fiscal year 2008 budget cycle. This fall, uh, we're going to be working with staff in developing objectives that help us uh, focus on environmentally friendly decisions in all department operations. Uh, and that's going to be starting this fall. Um, also, we're going to be preparing a list of citywide objectives and indicators for incorporation in the 08 budget. Um, we finance committee members may recall that in May, we reviewed a draft with them um, and got input from them and favorable comments. Uh, and basically, that's a list of objectives and objectives and indicators divided in about seven key policy areas um, in the city, and really kind of a, the highlights of all of the 800 objectives citywide. Uh, so that uh, we're going to be incorporating in the budget next year. Uh, finally, uh, I'll mention uh, we want to be finalizing our comparative indicators. Uh, and this is looking at how we compare with other cities on key uh, perform performance indicators. And also just establishing relationships with other cities, either via ICMA or another method, to compare annual performance. So uh, with that, I will conclude my presentation. And I'm open to any questions, if, if there are any. OK, just, just for fun, I've got a, a statistic for you. The uh, Anchorage Fire Department, uh, their um, um, time you know, is, is at seven minutes. And they're very proud of it. And ours is at four. But of course, they have thousands of uh, you know, miles. It's it's the biggest city I've ever seen. It just goes on and on and on. But still, they're very proud of their seven minutes, and we can be proud of our four minutes at the same time. Um, Mr. Horton. I just wanted to express my uh, appreciation for this. And I say that as a taxpayer first, um, chairman of the Finance Committee, and then as a businessman. Um, a, a lot of the um, 
Well, some of the comments that we get through our email system uh, raise the question that the city um, needs to be run more like a business. And my response to those is that that's what we're trying to do. And this program is a specific way in which a city can be run more like a business because it provides uh, quantifiable, measurable points uh, for us to review ourselves against. And I find it uh, to be um, very encouraging and most helpful uh, from the Finance Committee standpoint to be able to see where the pressure points as far as workload are really are occurring so that we can make sure that the scarce resources are put where they really need to be. And I think that's a, a, a great thing, and I, um, my kudos to you for moving this forward. Yeah, absolutely. Mr. Uh, Mr. Barnwell and then Ms. Schneider. Um, echo that series of comments. I wanted to pick a couple of things <clears throat> when he talks about uh, as a taxpayer I just want to compliment you on, like, for example, these zoning information reports, 99% of them were done within one day. The zoning information reports are tied into the transfer of real estate, people wanting to buy new houses and things. So that's a real, uh, that's a real public outreach where people find that the city is extremely efficient. Um, the same goes to the building inspections, having been a contractor. 100% of all building inspections were done the day that they were requested. I got to tell you, there are other governmental agencies on the South Coast who do not meet that standard by a mile. And so I'm greatly proud of, of that statistic. Um, the, uh, the police department, the, the number, the part one crimes being reduced by 69% during fiesta, solstice, and the 4th of July parade. Um, uh, that's, just, that's just prior planning where we got those lights out there on the street and, and we're, we've, we've worked with the bar and restaurant owners. I, I, I know, that's another thing where the cost to the city of those events, which can often be huge through police work, is now been brought into a graspable, wraparound, handleable amount because of the proactive uh, police department. And I, I want to say they deserve kudos also. The 9-11 and this is stunning. 9-11 is answered on an average of no more than three seconds. That's what you're looking for. So to everybody in all the departments of the, of the city, and, and we see them all the time, we give them 25-year pins and 10-year pins, I, I just think this is a wonderful organization to be part of, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be part of it. I have a couple of questions. Um, the library one, for example, this is just like an ad administrative thing, but we talked about the books. And um, forgive me a second while I look for it, but uh, it says that circulation of books at the library has risen by 2%. Do you know if that includes the number of books downloaded off of the web? No. Because we just instituted that new program, and I would suggest that that, that might not be in those numbers. Um, I, I didn't get a chance to talk to Carol Cater about it before she left, but that's something that we, if we're going to pat ourselves on the back for doing good work, I think that will boost up that 2% number. Um, and it appears, it appears in another couple of places here. The, it says the library website under use of technology, the website sites were expanded to include local book discussion groups. That's not the full story. Our web access on our library was expanded to include the downloading of something like 14,000 books. So that's another thing that the library deserves credit for. Um, the trees thing, as a lover of trees and a tree trimmer and working with the Forest Service, it would be really nice if we could plant more than 321 trees. That's fewer than one a day. On my own street, uh, we've needed to plant trees for 20 years. And it's interesting, just so it becomes public, the reason the trees don't get planted is because by city code or regulation or administrative regulation, they're supposed to be planted in plastic boxes that are inserted in the ground. They're kind of heavy-duty plastic that cause the tree roots to grow down rather than out and preserve the sidewalk. Um, that is the reason why the trees haven't been planted on my street, and I wonder if we could maybe deal with that one little weird component of why more trees haven't been planted. Um, I also want to compliment uh, all the work that you've done, Ms. Johnson, on the sustainable cities issue. I know that that's going to be a target for next year, and I think you know the entire council yeah. is 
way supportive of that whole concept. The mayor just described how how truly drastic that issue is for our for our globe. Um, we we're not just trying to be business like. We actually are business like. <clears throat> a question again, maybe not a question, a statement. How these get picked? We pick a topic. I guess it's a staff goes around and picks it up. I would like to make a suggestion of something that I think is close to Mr. Armstrong's heart because I've talked to him about it before, and that is that we we analyze our ADA compliance to the standards that we are supposed to be held to. And I look at the, I don't know which category it falls into, the adherence to state federal guidelines. I know we're supposed to update our ADA program, but for the coming year, I think that would be an excellent thing for all of our departments to look at and report back on and see the degree to which we have achieved success and how much more we need to do. Because we had a speaker earlier today at our meeting on ADA, Ms. Schneider brought up the importance of our uh, uh, of looking at our general plan 2030 and maybe incorporating ADA into residential development as well as commercial. So I would suggest that that's another thing that the city, as a good citizen, could look at. Yeah. But I want to say I want to agree with Mr. Horton. I, I'm I'm very proud to, of everything you've done, and I'm glad to be part of this group. Thanks. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor, maybe sure. I could address uh, Councilmember Barnwell's issue about the ADA. And sure. we'll be coming to you probably in the next 30 days with a contract with a consultant that's going to do a basically a comprehensive look at every city facility and make a list of what our deficiencies are. And then, then the next step after we identify all the deficiencies is to prioritize those deficiencies and come up with an action plan because we clearly have, we've done a lot, but we, we, we need to do it systematically, look at all of our facilities, and then prioritize what our workload will be. Thank you. I think there was a list like that, wasn't there? But it must be outdated by Yeah, it was done, I believe, old. about 10 years ago, yeah. and we found some gaps in the system, and so that's why we've, right. we're have we bringing somebody in to update it and also really to then put it into our planning actually process. actually implement and, it, yeah. Yeah, and it may take 20 or 30 years, but if we don't start now, yeah. we'll be behind, we'll even further behind. Yeah, the problem was before it just sort of sat there. And, and I know we did a little bit, but still. So that's good. Ms. Schneider. Thank you, and I echo what, Council Members Horton and Barnwell also said about the importance of this and how it helps us not only create a baseline but really monitor every little thing that we're doing and how the cumulative effect, not only financially but just sort of being a better city and, and providing services to people in the way that they would expect and um, so it becomes easier on the employees as well as performing those services. I do want to highlight um, the tremendous reduction in lost time due to injury and the uh, less sick time, um, not only because of the cost savings, but we're talking about our employees and they're not injured as often or they're not as sick as often. And, and there's that element, human element to it that I think is important. And um, the different types of, you mentioned the training in the fire department and how that led to a reduction in, in lost time in, to, due to injury by 19%. Due, so these are preventable things. The, the, uh, the auto accidents, preventable auto accidents down, I think what you said, by 7%. Um, how important it is to invest in training that will then help people's day-to-day -day lives, which, you know, I think uh, is key and important and certainly not, and then and then there on top of that is the financial component of having reductions in our workers comp premiums and uh, having other people take over or, or work overtime to compensate for those who aren't there so uh, I think that's a tremendous um, benefit and, and it great to see and, and uh, just to add that little human element to it uh, but congratulations and then finally I, I can't underline more the idea of, of comparative indicators I mean I, uh, the mayor mentioned difference between seven minutes and four minutes. You know, we might think four minutes is great, but if everyone else is already at two around us, well, <laughs> then maybe it's not so great. We have, you know, we can't compare. We need to find out regionally somehow how do we compare our what we think is good work and make sure it is good work. And and if it is something that is above and beyond what we see in the region, then we need to you know, make sure that people know about that. And, and uh, um, that's part of the uh, exposure issue of trying to make sure that people know that of the good work that the city's doing, not only on a day-to-day -day operational basis, but then, as was mentioned earlier, the sustainability component to it as well. I know our sustainability committee is looking at creating a similar type of 
uh, measurement uh, criterion similar to this where we have a baseline and then comparative uh, data from year to year to see how we can met, meet, get from point A to point B. So um, I think it's, it's just it's fascinating and um, I hope a model for other employers to look at. It's not that difficult to do. If, if uh, an employer of our size can do this, smaller ones can, certainly what larger ones can. And the, uh, just to overemphasize the training aspect and, and that this is not just something for management to look at. It's something that is incorporated and part of everyone, every employee here, and they have a sense of ownership about it, and they can give to their employer that way. I think that goes a long way. So um, every year I'm more and more impressed by this program. So thank you for a great presentation. Yeah, Ms. Falcone, and then Mr. Um, House. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I want to join in the chorus of congratulations. And uh, I know what a lot of work this was to start up this program. And, um, you know, some may have thought that it was just a feel-good program and it was just, you know, and, you know, we'd all dress in Hawaiian shirts and feel good in this chamber for, you know, whatever, half a day or a day. And it really has set forth incredibly um, uh, ascertainable, you know, these real quantifiable kinds of uh, touchstones that you can look at, you can get your mind around, and you can really um, you can really quantify and see if there's been progress and, you know, where maybe there are revenues that haven't been uh, yet uh, achieved and maybe where there are efficiencies that can, you know, be realized even more and more. And um, it's a big organization, and I know it's a lot to grapple with, and I think you've done a, a magnificent job. And um, just... The, one of the things it really does give to us is it gives us an opportunity to really compare apples to apples and um, not to be a stick in the mud, but, you know, in, or in, in that vein, um, there is a really uh, important distinction, I think, to stay focused on exactly what it is you're comparing. In other words, in, in for instance, the 911 responses, that's three seconds on average. That means a dispatcher picks up a phone. In fire response, four minutes, that means that there's an engine that actually arrives at somebody's house. In police response is, I don't know, I didn't hear, but um, it varies very much because there's a, a long laundry list of um, different priorities that have to be uh, really gone through on sort of a split second in between the dispatcher and the police. So the three seconds for a response to 911 should not be, because I know we'll get emails about this because I get emails about all this stuff all the time, um, is not to mean that we're trying to say that a, a squad car will arrive at either your door or your business within three seconds or four minutes. That's not what it means. It's not meant to mean that, and it certainly isn't the truth, and it doesn't happen. Now, what does happen, we'll have to, you know, really ascertain. But the fact that we have someone answering a 911 call, that's what the three seconds means. And I think that's a fabulous number. And four minutes for the, for the fire department is a fabulous number. Um, it really does depend on resources. And the fact that we have enough dispatchers to do that is really, really important. So I just want to make sure that people are really clear, um, because I know my box will light up <laughs> and people say, what are you talking about? They don't come that fast. And so I just wanted to put that out there and, and make sure that we know what we're talking about. All of the various different um, departments and folks that are involved in this, I really want to say congratulations and thank you so much because when we do the budget, we it's one of the things that we really do look at because all these P3 um, of evaluations are listed in there and it gives us an idea of how the money is spent and how maybe the money can be better spent or otherwise allocated. So great job and thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay, Mr. House. I, I wanted to ask a, a, a question about how, um, as somebody else raised it, but I, I really wanted to hear how it works out. How, how do these um, get generated at the employee level. I mean, I can imagine like a department gets together and they've collected all this stuff, but it really comes down to individuals within your organization at some point. Am I correct in that? And how, what's the process that you go through? If you just briefly describe it to us, how does that work? Madam Mayor, mm -hmm. Council Member House, um, in each department, it's very different. Uh, and I would say even within the department, each program has a different method that they use in developing the P3 objectives. 
Um, when we start our process, uh, we ask departments to start looking at and revising their objectives for the upcoming year, uh, generally around January, and now this year we're working on it this fall. Um, some uh, program supervisors uh, start working with their staff through meetings, uh, discussing uh, what do we think about the performance objectives we've had in the current year? You know, what needs to be uh, improved? What, may, what objectives need to be dropped? Maybe some that are no longer meaningful uh, for where we're trying to go. Uh, what types of projects should we be adding? Um, so those types of discussions happen uh, with staff and getting ideas. Where can we improve? A lot of uh, line staff, I mean, they're working with the services uh, day in and day out, and they have a lot of ideas about uh, new objectives they can add. Um, and each program, though, I mean, we're still working on you know, improving more interaction and getting more staff involvement in developing the objectives. So it varies, I'd say, throughout all the programs. In some uh, programs, uh, I know in... Um, Let's take uh, wastewater uh, collection, for example. They meet every month, and they go over you know, where they are in uh, their different P3 measures or in uh, water uh, distribution. They're looking at their water main breaks. You know, where were we uh, compared to the last month? And how, much, how many more breaks before you know, we're exceeding our, our, our target? And they don't exceed their target because they're watching it so carefully okay. as a group. And, and I might add that this is the second year that, that we're currently in of a two-year budget, and so one of the things that I've talked to the department heads this year about is as we go into fiscal year 08, that we're entering a new two-year planning period, and so it's really a good time to start really early in the process and look at these objectives and what hasn't worked and what, what we think works well. Uh, the other thing is there's also an iterative process. When we go through the budget, I meet with each one of the departments, and I'd say we spend – two-thirds of the time not talking about dollars and cents at all, but talking about these performance issues and program planning, because um, that's really the meat of what these departments do on a day-to-day -day basis is providing services and doing work. And so we, and we, we, we have little fights about, well, is 95 enough? Or, you know, you did 96 shit last year. You know, why don't you push the bar a little bit? And we have a lot of kind of fun discussions, but also serious about, you know, you know, trying to get ourselves better every year. And also in some cases we look at an objective and we go, you know what, that didn't really, is not a valid measure of what we do. Let's throw that one out and look for something else that's a better indicator. Of, of what we're trying to accomplish. Well, so uh, what I understand, what I'm hearing, which I really am uh, interested in, is this sort of a feedback loop that's going on and the communication between the different uh, members of the team and there's sort of an alignment within each team and it, it moves up or down or around through the organization. It uh, sounds like uh, much more going on than just, you know, nice tables that the city council gets to look at and, you know, feel good about. It's, there's a whole organization thing going on there. Yeah. Well, I've just really admired that. I, as somebody mentioned a, f a few minutes ago about how and we often get asked that the city, you know, could it run like a business, you know, and I just think that it can be the other way around in a way. I know a number of businesses that should run like the city, and they'd, <laughs> they'd be doing pretty darn good. I just uh, A couple more things. We had a huge emphasis and effort, and I, um, just prior to or close to when you came on board, uh, Mr. Armstrong, about customer service. That was a huge effort, and I see uh, in here the customer satisfaction surveys with five of the departments. Um, I also see a, num a lot of these, that public outreach, things like that. Um, it, it seems like uh, the more we can emphasize that interface with the public piece, you know, and it's a lot of it, it sort of seems like warm fuzzies, but the fact is that the, um, there's, um, there's an awful lot to what we hear about, which has to do with the way people have been treated or the way they've been in interacted with, lots of compliments and appreciation, and then every once in a while somebody who's upset or concerned. And I know that you take those things very seriously and try to respond to them, but that would be a big area of emphasis I would hope we continue to work on throughout the, the coming years. And then just uh, one more thing here. This is, um, what, a 1,000-plus employees we have? Amazing, amazing way to run an organization to pull it together around these kinds of goals, have it show up in our budget, and uh, and do it in a way that each person's um, in, enriched by the experience. And that's what I really hope continues to happen, because doesn't that build morale? Yeah, and I think that's where we really want to go. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the report. We're going to take just a real quick break uh, while finance gets up here and puts it all together so we can see it. So a quick stretch, but we've got four more items of substance here, so we're going to have to come back early, as quickly as we can. Thank you.
read the next one, item 11. Interim financial statements for the fiscal year ended June 30, 2006. Okay, this is for the whole year. Mr. Samario, you're going to do it? Thank you, Madam Mayor, members mm -hmm. of council. Bob Samario, Assistant Finance Director, and it's my pleasure to present to you the year-end results for fiscal year 2006. As you know, each quarter we come to the Council and Finance Committee and we talk about the status of revenues and expenses and expenditures in relation to budget. Um, today we're here to give you the final numbers, the final results, no more prognostications or, or guessing. These are the final numbers for the year. As always, we'll start with the general fund and we'll, we'll look at revenues and expenditures and of course highlight the major uh, variances from budget. We'll probably spend more time on the revenue side. We'll also present to you the updated the latest and greatest multi-year forecast for the general fund that includes the 2006 results. And then we'll spend some time looking at briefly at the enterprise funds. This is a summary of all rev general fund revenues, uh, highlighting the key major revenues, primarily tax revenues, as, and it also includes what our non-departmental revenues are, I'm sorry, departmental revenues in total. And you can see it shows the amended budget. The amended budget is effectively the same as the adopted budget. We really don't make any changes throughout the year to our revenue estimates, unlike appropriations. We'll start with sales tax. You can see that we have a favorable variance in sales tax revenues, about $318,000 over budget. That amounts to about 1.6% of the amended budget. And you might recall that in the first quarter of the year, we received about 14.5% growth um, in the first quarter in relation to the prior year, which is a pretty phenomenal growth, but the remaining quarters weren't as uh, rosy. And in fact, third quarter we had, we were flat, we had a 0% growth. But overall, the first quarter did carry us through for, to the year, end of the year, and, and led to that favorable variance at year end. In property taxes, you can see that it's, as the last several years, it's been the star um, of all our revenues. It exceeded budget by $1.8 million. We budgeted 16 point, almost $17 million, and it came in at 18.8. And the three primary reasons for that, that variance, one is we did receive some money this year, about $320,000 in property tax in lieu of ELF. It was a cleanup payment from the prior year that was unbudgeted. And in addition, and we'll talk more about this later, you'll see a slide on this, but the supplemental property taxes, those are payments um, from re, based on reassessments of properties, either change of ownership or um, improvements to real property. They came in substantially higher than we expected, and in, and in fact, in prior years. And then lastly, just the fact that, that property taxes and real estate values are going up and we've just seen tremendous growth beyond what we expected. In our TOT, our transient occupancy tax revenues, you can see we're well over budget, half a million dollars um, in relation to our $11.5 million budget. And you might recall that beginning as, fact, as far back as March of 2005, we were seeing that our TOT revenues were growing phenomenally. We are seeing double-digit growth in just about every month. And in fact, from March 2005 through February 2006, our revenues grew on average 12%, almost 12%, so pretty phenomenal. The last five months were, were a little lower, and so in the, for the year we ended up with 8.6% overall growth, but still very good. In terms of the users' tax revenues, um, that's the 6% tax on utilities, um, 139000 not substantially over budget, but still good, good news. Uh, primarily, we saw the increase in cellular taxes, cellular UT as well as um, natural gas UT. Franchise fees, you can see a substantial a favorable variance there, $437,000. That was primarily attributable to the 1% surcharge uh, on electric UT that, or, I'm sorry, electric franchise fees that was enacted in early this year. We didn't budget for that because we weren't sure when that was going to be approved by the California PUC, but it did get approved in early in the fiscal year, and so it resulted in about a half million dollars in revenues, half of which are restricted for undergrounding utility lines um, and are accounted for in a separate fund. The benefit to the general fund was about 250. So in total, you can see that we were uh, we had a favorable variance of 3.6 million dollars um, over the amended budget. Now, I want to introduce two columns, uh, some uh, sort of a different perspective, because this is important to point out. A as you know, mid-year, we um, start looking at our revenues real seriously and seeing how we're going to end the year. And it also feeds into the work we do in developing fiscal year 2007 revenue estimates. And so we, we made projections roughly in February, March of this year, all the major revenues. You can see uh, that's the first green column. And then the, you can see the difference between what we projected as would be the variance and what the actual variance was. And for example, sales tax revenues um, 
We're $318,000 over budget. We had anticipated that we would be $331,000 over budget when we developed the 07 revenue estimate, so we actually fell a little short of those projections. Property tax, you could see we were, we, we were under. They, it still came in higher than we projected. We projected $1.4 million over budget uh, at mid-year, and yet it came in even higher than that by $480,000. But essentially, if you look at the difference, the last column, with the exception of property tax revenues, we were pretty close to what, what the actual uh, results were when we projected for 06 and developed those 07 estimates. Department of Revenues did pretty well, 181,000, but we kind of look at those differently, primarily because they're kind of their money to spend. They really aren't part of the non-departmental group that, is, that benefits all. But in total, $788,000 difference between what we projected and what the actual variance was. And I mentioned the supplemental property tax just to give you some perspective, because that was going back. You can see that was property taxes where we saw the biggest difference between our projections and the actual results. You can see that in 2001 we received $256,000, but then between in 02 through 04 we we went up to about a half million dollars, but then 2005 jumped up by to $916,000, almost double the 04 n number. When we developed our projections for 06 and therefore the estimates for 07, we assumed that we would re achieve about the same as 05, which is a pretty strong revenue growth, but yet it came in at 1.3, and that was primarily because of we got one payment in June, late June of $420,000 in supplemental property taxes um, that we just said it didn't anticipate it would be that, that magnitude. So really the variance that we saw in the pre previous slide overall was attributable to almost entirely the supplemental property tax revenues that came in. Hmm. Just because I like numbers, I wanted to show you some perspective on, on prior years. This is a 10-year history of our overall general fund variances in revenues, and you can see that it's sort of all over the place, but I want to just put some context mm -hmm. to this. Prior to 9-11, you could see that the variances and the percentages are pretty substantial. We had uh, from $2 million all the way up to $5.6 million in 2001 revenue variance. And as you know, during this time period, we have our revenues are doing great. We were in an economic boon. Everything was, was, was in a positive sense. And we had really no pressure to, to increase or push our revenue estimates. So we we're seeing some pretty substantial variances. But beyond that, beginning in 2002, the story changes dramatically. A lot of things going on since in that time frame. Again, our revenue started to decline. The economic economy went south. And then plus our costs started going up. Remember, retirement went up substantially. Our health insurance premiums, our insurance premiums went up dramatically. So we had a, an incentive to try to be more aggressive in our revenue estimates so as to not cut unnecessarily the organization. We were in a cut mode, and we didn't want to sort of be conservative in our revenues and then cut later on, find a big cut that we cut unnecessarily. So we pushed our estimates, and as, and combination with them going down, we saw that their variances were substantially lower. In the first five years, they had a 6% average variance. In the, in the last five years, 1.6. And 06 was a little bit of an anomaly. You can see we went from a 1.8 into 2002, 2.1, and then a negative 1.2, and then 1.4, then all of a sudden 4.1. And if you just take out the property tax variance out of there, you'd see it would be closer to 2%, which is more consistent with the prior four years. Any questions before we move on to expenditures? Mm -hmm. Okay, here is the expenditures by department. And uh, the most important thing to point out here is in the second to the last column, which just shows the dollar variance, and you can see that they're all positive numbers, which means that every single department, as they're supposed to, um, came in under budget, and of course to varying degrees. And you can see at the very bottom, uh, the $3.1 million is the total variance after encumbrances in the general fund, a pretty substantial number. Uh, the biggest contributors to that variance were police, parks and recreation, and community development. And in those departments, as well as other departments, that it was attributable to primarily to salary and benefit savings, vacancies, whether it was retirements, turnover in staff, um, et cetera. Yeah. In fact, in 06, of the total variance of $3.1 million, about 72% of that was in the salaries and benefits category. The, the other con big contributor was appropriated reserve, 10.84%. And as you might recall, in, in 07, we did away with the appropriated reserve because we just hadn't been using it over the last few years. And so just as we did with revenues, here are the, the, the general fund expenditure variances over a, a nine-year period beginning in 1998. You could see that um, from 98 to 2004, the variances were one to 2% range. Um, and then in 2005 and in, in 2006, the variances were pretty substantial. And it's primarily salaries and benefits, as this next slide will indicate, 
This is just isolating salaries and benefits, the budget and the year in actual and the variance. You could see that from 1998 to 2004, the average variance was just 1.3 percent, yet in 2005 it went up to almost 3 percent, 2006, 3 percent. And I think it's important to note that you know, a big part of this was, was the enhancement to our retirement benefit. Since October 31st of, this, of 2005, which occurred in fiscal 2006, we've, we've seen 48 retirements. Again, a big factor is enhanced retirement benefits, uh, but just other, other turnover, other terminations as well. But uh, that was a major contributor to this variance, I believe. So I indicated the big variances in police, parks, rec, community development, and the high number of vacancies. Uh, of the 48, I mentioned 32 were the general fund, and of course the en enhancement of retirement formula a factor. So this slide sort of brings it all together, the revenues and expenditures, and the first column of numbers is the adopted budget. Um, really not a significant n number because we it gets amended throughout the year, but the adopted budget did provide for the use of reserves of $7.9 million. The amended budget, because of the impact of carryovers from prior year from 05 and 06, increased that use of reserves on a budgetary basis to almost $8.9 million, $8.8 million, but the actual results substantially different. You can see that um, revenues and expenditure were almost identical, and expenditures do include capital. So we did actually end up adding to reserves, not using reserves, $86,100. Now you back out encumbrances, and just to show what the overall variance, the, we had ended up with a favorable variance of $6.8 million between actual and including encumbrances in the amended budget. So uh, what does this all mean in terms of our multi-year forecast? I think it's important to sort of incorporate those results into what we, you've seen as sort of a financial plan. I'm going to be highlighting, of course, first starting with fiscal 2006, which is um, boxed in green. And you can see that essentially we, we end up the year balance, as, as I just showed. We're a little bit different here because of, we include the GPU or general plan update activities in this number, but we essentially are balanced in 06. Final results, revenues and expenditures essentially match. On an ongoing basis, you can see that in 07, the adopted budget already done provides for the use of reserves of, of about a half million dollars to fund capital. You can see above that number our capital is $1.3 million. So actually revenues are covering part of that or most of that and, and we only need a half million to cover capital and reserves from reserves. But in 08 and 09 you see we're, we're in the black, 180,000 in 08, so 521 in 09. Now this is sort of how does that, the ending balances over those next few years, how does that compare to what our re, re policy reserves indicate we should have. In 06, you can see that we are required to have, I'm sorry, we ended the year with 23.759 million. Our reserve requirements are 25.6, so we ended up the year about $1.9 million into our budgetary reserves in 06. On an ongoing basis, you can see that by 09, we, would, we will be, under this forecast, into our budget reserves about 40% of the 10.9 or $4.3 million. Okay, this is now comparing to what you'd seen previously, version 15. What did that say and what does this version 16 say now and to what extent are they different? First, looking at 06, in the version 15, the, the, the previous version that you've seen, the, the net loss, if you will, for the year, op revenues under expenditures, we expected them to be about $4 million and that our reserves under policy would be about $4.9 million. Going down to version 16, in addition to reserves, 28,000, and our pol we'd be below policy reserves, $1.9 million. By 09, you could see that on, on an ongoing basis, which I think is an important measure, well, how are we doing on an operating basis? Are we, are we generating surpluses or deficits? And under this, on both two scenarios, you could see that under 15, $562,000 in the black, in version 16, about the same, not a significant increase on an ongoing basis. Clearly, the, the, the benefit was in our reserves, whereas in version 15, we would have been $7.2 million into our budgetary reserves. We are now projecting we'd be $4.3 million into our budget, budgetary reserves. This, we, we've made no changes to the assumptions in, in this forecast. What we, all we've done is incorporate the actual results for 06 into this model. And instead of the recommended budget, we have included the adopted budget in 07, which is substantially the same as what you've seen before. 
So unless we have any questions, I'll go on to the enterprise funds. Okay. So enterprise funds, um, the important thing, I just as with general fund, all expenses are within budgetary um, authorizations. I'm going to primarily focus on revenues as we go through each, although I'll comment on some expenses. Starting with the water fund, you can see they're under budget by $762,000. Weather, the cold weather, wet weather had an impact on the, on the sale of water. And you can see right below that, expenditures are under budget by 1.8. Um, we, we purchased less water because we had to because we sold less, so that's and it's pretty um, consistent. In the wastewater fund, you can see they're al they're almost right on the on the dot with the revenues, eighty five thousand dollar difference. Statistically, is basically identical. Uh, you can see also below that they are also under budget. They were one fund that did have a significant number of retirements, un unusual for that fund, and so a large part of this one point one million dollars was because of that. Downtown parking, um, good news. They were right on the, just about on the mark with revenues. As you might recall, that we included in 06 budget an estimate of $900,000 based on the implementation of new rates in January of 06. And um, we weren't really sure how that would, that would end the year, but it came in right on the mark. So that's, that's great to hear and good news. And the airport, they're always doing a great job, primarily because um, I kid them because they're kind of conservative on, the, on their estimates, and so they end up looking really great at the end of the year. But they are, they are seeing great, good increases in passenger counts. Uh, they always sort of estimate conservatively 1% increase per year, and this year they happen to have about 3%, which is, I think it was the highest in, in, um, in the country for domestic travel. So a big growth in passenger counts for the airport. Um, and of course, as passenger counts go up, rental car revenues go up, concession revenues go up, and so to parking fees, and that's essentially why we have that variance. The golf course, the revenues are down, just like with the water fund. When it's wet, wet and cold, people don't play. People like me are kind of are chicken to go out in the wet and cold weather. <laughs> so their rounds are down, and their revenues are correspondingly down. And in the waterfront, well, I just wanted to point point out that. And the good thing in the golf course is that they were able to save about $135,000, which just about totally offset their uh, revenue shortfall. And waterfront, really nothing um, significant to point out there. To me, $200,000 on $10.4 million revenue, there it's it's basically on the mark. Expenses as well, $297,000. Um, nothing really substantial going on there. So that concludes my report. Unless. Okay. And I'd be happy to, of course, answer any questions. No, it's a really good one. It's interesting to see the numbers. I like numbers, too. Um, Mr. Horton, Finance Committee. Well, I read this uh, Sunday afternoon, and my first reaction was, Yahoo, I've got to go call Josh Molina. <laughs> but that wouldn't work. No. Um, but uh, <laughs> anyway. Uh, Sorry, Vladimir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can call Vladimir. Uh, I spent quite a few hours uh on this, uh, this matter, yeah. but it is it is awfully good news for all of us in the yeah. city to see these kind of numbers turn around like that. But uh, after that, after I calmed down a little bit, and I went back through and looked at it in a little bit more detail, and I think there's um, no taking away the fact that these are great numbers and, and they do put us in a much better position with respect to the reserves. But in terms of the ongo ongoing um, Impact in terms of our building budgets for the for the upcoming years, um, it is it is good news. But um, I really got to emphasize as chair of finance that we need to remain cautious. Um, the property tax um, revenue looks really good, but um, I think it's pretty uh, pretty commonly known that there's a slowdown right now in real estate, and we have no idea how long or how deep that slowdown will be. And a lot of that revenue is produced because of, uh, of turnover of, of properties and, and sales at higher prices, and that may or may not happen in the future. Uh, the um, expenditure side, uh, saving money in most of the departments, a lot of that related to salaries. I have uh, reason to believe that a lot of those positions will be filled in uh, 06, 07, and 07, 08, and so those, those, that revenue source probably won't be there. And then finally, um, there's some economic trends, which I think we're kind of wavering right now on the cusp of, um, of a dropping into a recessionary period or not, and it depends on what the Fed does and what consumer optimism is and a whole lot of uh, worldwide influences, which we have virtually no control over. So I am pleased and I am optimistic 
and I think it's a great report, but I want to say that uh, we need to remain cautious as we uh, build for the future in the city. Thank and you. thank you for your efforts. Mr. House? Oh, heck, it was kind of glasses half empty there. <laughs> but I agree. And caution for sure. I, I just want to ask some questions, and it's both for myself and for the public uh, watching this. Um, the required policy reserves that we talk about on the um, version 16 multi year forecast, um, where we say this year it would be required that we have 25,642,000 set aside. What's the, what? Part of that is what we call uh, emergency reserves versus policy, well, versus not emergency reserves. Madam Mayor, Councilmember House, you can see in this chart here that we have the three required policy reserves, the 10 percent budgetary reserve, and then the 15 percent disaster reserve that I think that you're referring to um, in 06, 9.8, and, no, and then for the 15 percent, $14.8 million. And so when we quote dip into reserves we're dipping into the the first uh, level if you will the budget reserve 10 percent first right and we're always ne we're never touching the other if we can possibly help it and then how do we get those reserves in the first place those reserves are accumulated and and by surpluses at the end of the year in the late 80s early 90s before the the, the recession we were accumulating quite a bit of reserves our sales tax at that time and property tax were doing really well and uh, we started to build up some surpluses, and then at that time, council wisely decided that you know we better to come up with some kind of a policy that says how much should we be maintaining so that we don't end up spending them. And that was that policy was adopted in 1995. Okay, and uh, and yet when we look, even though we're in much better shape this year than was anticipated in our budget or even our revised budget, we we look forward now and we see that we're going to continue to dip deeper into that budget reserve category over the next uh, three years at least. Madam Mayor, Councilman Howard, that, that's, a, that's a great point because as, let me go to the previous slide. Yeah. You could see that in 08 and 09, we have surpluses and so it kind of begs the question, why are we further going into our reserves? And the reason for that is because each year as our budget grows, so do our mm -hmm. reserve requirements. They're a function of our operating budget, essentially 25% plus one million. So in 09, even though we may have a surplus, our, our requirements grow go up. The, our operating budget base goes up, so we have to fund more. So these go up automatically without doing anything. Well, I know that, that the city council is certainly part of this problem, uh, meaning that um, if there were a P3 for our financial health, one of them that we all would share is to reverse that trend and be able to ensure that we have um, a continuing if not a growth, but a maintenance of our reserves at the levels that we've set in policy. And um, and uh, we make these big decisions on the budget every year, and we're in our negotiations and all these different things, you know, trying to work this out. But um, can, is it safe to say that, that's, that that really is a goal that we have, that we share as a city, and that both at the staff level? And I mean, I, I feel it up here that we're trying as hard as we can to keep it stable and sustainable, but verify that for me, will you? <laughs> sure. Madam Mayor, Council Member House, I think uh, I, I, won't, I won't speak to the City Administrator's Office, but from my perspective, I think that is a goal. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you might recall that uh, in the out years, we made some assumptions about year invariances, and one could argue that maybe they're a little bit too conservative. But one of the reasons we specifically did that was to help our cause in getting back to where we're at fully, fully funding our reserves. Mm -hmm. And that's specifically why we are maintaining that assumption. But I think we do have every intention and expect that beyond 2009 that hopefully we'll start to kind of cross the line and we can start generating surpluses to build up the reserves back to policy. So we keep our belts tight and uh, and yet still try to deliver that good customer service I was talking about. Okay, thank you, sir. Ms. Falcone. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I guess just for simplicity's sake, um, having a $100 million general fund, 25% of that is... $25 million. I mean, I'm no math wizard, but hey, even I can do those numbers. Um, and a percent is different than a cap number. Now, for some reason, back in the old days, um, the capital reserve was capped at a $1 million number, not a percent of reserves, whereas the other two reserves, the budget reserves and the disaster reserves, were given percentages not capped 
numbers. So if, and that's a policy decision, whether or not you want to mm -hmm. do it at a percent or whether you want to do it at a capped number. But just for illustration purposes, if we were to cap the other two at the $25 million amount, and I'm not suggesting that we do, it's just an illustration, then as we project forward, that $4 million uh, that you see there in 09 would not be four million three hundred thousand. It would be something very different because it wouldn't be 25 percent of 28 million dollars. It would be uh, something else. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't this is why I went to law school and not finance school? No. Um, but I guess my point is is that as we grow the general fund from $100 million to $110 million to $120 million, that 25% continues bigger. to increase correspondingly, right. whereas if it was a capped number, the $120 million of the general fund would have a less amount taken out of it. Can you, can you sure. Madam Mayor, verify Falcone, that? Falcone, I, mean, I, I know it's right. <laughs> it's just trying to simplify it in terms so that people really understand what they're looking to add. Right. So, if, so we could have $4 million worth of deficit in our reserves without spending a dime more in the projections going forward. Right. So correct. if we cap it at a certain number, then that money then becomes freed up, if you will. And that's a policy decision whether or not you want to do it on percent or do it on a cap. We've chosen, or at least in the good old days, they chose to do it on percent. We can reiterate that and say that that's what we want to do. We've capped the, the capital reserves at a million dollars, and, and that's fine. I don't, I'm not suggesting that we change it. I just want to make it very clear that people understand that without spending another cent, it looks like we're eating up more reserves. So that's a distinction with some, I think, weighty merit to it that I just wanted to make clear. Yeah, Mr. Horton. The reason for not yeah. <laughs> capping it is that uh, anywhere uh, I've looked in business or uh, industry or in world enterprise where you run a, um, a cap, uh, the gradual impact of inflation uh, gets away from you. And then when that situation does occur where you, you need those reserves, you simply don't have it. And uh, what, what you're saying here is, is completely true, and it means that we have to run a tighter organization. We do have to, to run a, a, a leaner, trimmer ship in order to get there. But if we don't do that and we ever do need those reserves, they simply won't be there and we won't have them to call on. So that's why I think the floating, whatever council put that in many years ago, um, did the right thing. Right. And, and I, I tend to agree with that because things always do cost more money in the future than they do today. So to keep up with that without making it feel as though we're suddenly having to catch up and spend a whole lot of money is probably the right way to do it. I'm just trying to make cl very clear that people, especially folks out there, understand um, exactly why it looks like we're eating into reserves without spending dime one. Now, if we choose to spend dime one or dime three or dime eight, then those numbers numbers will be different, but always you have to factor in that there's a certain growth in there that is happening irrespective of spending the money because of the float. Well, uh, the other part of that is, and you're right, you're right, but the other part of that is that 90 percent has grown enough to make the 10 percent grow, too. So that 90 percent is extra revenue that we will have in the future if that's going to grow. I mean, if it doesn't grow, then you don't, you know, so so that's the half full part. Um, I wanted to look at the capital expenditures. Can we go back to that one? Um, yeah, Madam Mayor, if before we look we, across. Before uh, we leave this point, could I make a point? Oh, I, okay, but I feel like. Two seconds worth, but go ahead. Um, well, I, I just want to back up um, Council Member Falcone, at least in this, that we do have a very large amount set aside for reserves, atypically so for a city of this size, and that um, as the, the required reserves um, grow, uh, it, it, it's not the same. I mean, uh, especially for a budget reserve, uh, and, and, uh, the extra $2 million in a budget reserve from, an, from 
the $88 million budget to the $110 million budget is not the same as the previous $2 million, not as vital as the previous $2 million. And um, while I agree that for the disaster reserve, you can't really change that formula because you're, you're, you're banking on being able to operate a certain amount of time, a budget reserve is for a different purpose. And I think we should at least have the conversation about what is an ideal amount of a budget reserve. So if I hear you correctly, ma'am, if you'll indulge me for a second, um, you, the, ex, the additional $2 million you just referred to is more diluted than the prior $2 million. Was that your point? That's my point. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay, I think I'll make my point some other time. Uh, anybody else want to speak? Okay, thank you very much. This is, and we need a motion to accept the interim financial I'll statement. I'll move to move report. Accept. <laughs> I'll second. Let the, the chair. <laughs> chair move. Member second. Okay, thank you very much. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Very good. Present. Okay, item number 20, yes. 12. <laughs> I was dreaming there. 12. Revise. Madam Mayor, I just wanted to say that with regard to all those percentages, uh, Yogi Berra was famously quoted as saying that 90% of baseball is 50% mental. That's right. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Revised agricultural water rates, including recommendation B, that Council adopt by reading of title only, a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara amending resolution number 06056, establishing certain city fees for fiscal year 2007, including water and wastewater rates, okay. adjusting the metered water charges for agricultural water service. Okay, Mr. Nisich. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council. My name is Tony Nisich, the Public Works Director. With me this afternoon is uh, Steve Mack, our Water Resources Manager. The item before us is the revised agricultural water rates. Um, a little bit of history. On June 20th of this year, the Council adopted the water rate fee resolution as recommended, except that the leaving the agricultural rates for the fiscal year 2006 level. Uh, and they requested we get additional uh, information from the Water Commission, uh, which we did. After the, <clears throat> the matter was reviewed by the Water Commission on July 10th and again on August 14th, and we're here today to give you that recommendation. Mr. Mack will, will rep report on the uh, results of the Water Commission deliberations on this matter. Okay, Ms. Mack. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Um, at the two uh, meetings in July and August, the uh, Water Commission heard from several Ag customers, uh, heard a staff report. Uh, we had an expert uh, testify, Ben Faber of UC Cooperative Extension. Um, Farm advisor to talk about the um, issues surrounding the uh, the ag water rate um, at the two meetings. The uh, at the end of the two meetings, the uh, in the second meeting, the water commission adopted uh, three recommendations that uh, the 3.5 rate increase should apply to all customer classes. Uh, as you may recall, the uh, the uh, June budget included a 3.5 rate increase for uh, recommended for all customer classes. Um, recommended that the staff should perform an audit of existing agricultural customers to confirm eligibility. And uh, recommended that the block one rate be equal to 90% of the current recycled water rate or $1.46 per HCF, including the 3.5% increase. The uh, Water Commission uh, reviewed a number of possible rates and reasons for the uh, setting the ag rate and settled on a standard of 90% of the recycled rate. Uh, prior to this, uh, the recycled water rate and the ag water rate were, were the same. They are lowest cost uh, water, and um, in their deliberations, the Water Commission uh, recommended uh, that that uh, the standard for the ag water rate should be 90 percent of the recycled water rate, which puts it for this go around uh, at a dollar 46. Um, this uh, recommendation does not have a significant financial impact on the water fund. Uh, the uh, there are 71 customers in the ag class. Uh, last year they brought in approximately $92,000. This change would reduce the revenue approximately $9,000 to the water fund out of $26 million 
in total revenues. Uh, for comparison purposes, uh, ag rates in our other local public water purveyors, our Goleta Water District is a dollar per HCF. Um, Montecito Water District is a dollar fifty-six per hundred cubic feet, and the Carpinteria Valley Water District ranges from a dollar fifty-two to a dollar seventy-two per hundred cubic feet. Um, so our recommendation is that, uh, and it's in the uh, attached resolution, that the uh, ag water rate be uh, reduced to a dollar forty-six for this coming fiscal year, okay. and that uh, we also perform an audit of existing agricultural customers, which we will do. So do the other water districts have a step up like we do when you use more, it costs you more? I believe the other uh, water districts all have a, uh, an allotment approach as, as we do, do as they? well. Yeah, I thought yes. so too. Okay, thank you. Okay, any questions or? Oh, I have a couple of people who would like to speak though. Should we do that first? Okay. Mr. Little, Steve Little, to be followed by Harriet Sharp, and those are the two. Mr. Little. Yep. Whoops. There. Just turned it. Mr. Wiley has one already. There's enough there for everybody. While you're handing those you. out, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Stephen M. Little. I was named by my father after Stephen T. Mather, the first director of parks in the National. You might say I was born an environmentalist and a conservationist. I have on my Yosemite shirt, I don't know, Yosemite Valley and uh, avocado groves, I think, kind of oh. go together there, both open space. I'm here as an avocado grower to ask that you deny the revised ag water rates recommended by the Water Commission and to reinstate the $1.32 rate that was recommended by the Water Commission on July 10th for the following reasons. My grove is described by the site plan that you have there. It is an approved mixed-use development adopted by the city in 1973. My lot came with an irrigation system and six avocado trees denoted on the area below the house. The dark numbers denote the number of trees we all planted in our little group. Uh, my trees have been thin over the years where I now have about 20 large trees. These trees are akin to a five horsepower engine. They you can equate that in mechanical terms. They require sunshine, water, fertilizer, and my labor. And they go into shock if water is denied and I lose three years of work effort if that happens and it has. Next sheet describes water costs. My history of water costs before you is revealing that I have lost $9,500 over 11 years. Why do I continue? I do so for my good health, as a fire break for my house and the Westwood Hills development, and the beauty of the trees. I do this cheerfully. Mr. Wiley has a letter from me that reveals that my net benefit we drop in the price from a dollar forty-six to a dollar thirty-two is a twenty-five dollar a year benefit. So it's clearly not the money involved. The principle is we need open space, we need our trees, and uh, my school below me gets to raise their kids in an urban environment, which they enjoy. The water rate study before you indicates I'll be back before you in about five years to again plead my case. You see the changes in the rates for the desired rate, the staff recommendation, so forth. I ask that you unshackle me from that rate increase so indicated, especially being tied to the reclaimed water rate. Our state constitution says that farmers need have first draw on all water. Bureau of Reclamation also says that. And the city general plan says that the city is to preserve, promote, protect, and enhance agriculture. What's gone wrong? 
please reinstate the dollar thirty two rate now or at least send it back to the finance committee for final resolution that happened in nineteen ninety five so in labor, my labor costs have gone from eight to thirteen dollars, but the avocados still run the same price. Foreign fruit and insects, and I brought along a situation here. You might take a look. You never see these this fruit in the market because it's been attacked by the thrips, and they turn awful brown color. Oh. We can have them at home. They they'd be delicious tonight. You just peel them off, and the avocado looks just like that inside. But about half my crop was like that, and that was common throughout the avocado industry this year. There are no other customers for my ag water. I don't buy it. It stays in the lake, goes over the dam in three or four years. That's false conversation, conservation. No one has ever complained. I've never seen a letter in the article in the paper at all complaining about ag water and so forth. Ag water is a pure revenue source. We'll go right to that negative number that you saw up there in the water fund. The more you sell me, the, the more it goes on that course. I'm available for questions. Under the rules of engagement, I have to leave the council chambers at the moment. But I'll be outside, and if during your discussions you want to call me back, I could come back and answer your questions. Um, any questions at the moment? Oh, thank you. Mr. You want to talk to Mr. Wiley? Yeah, Mr. Wiley, why is, why is Mr. Little required to leave the chamber? Madam Chair, uh, Councilmember Williams, uh, it's, it's fairly apparent in, in looking at Mr. Little's situation, which uh, the water staff asked me to do, asked the city attorney's office to do, that he probably has a conflict of interest under the Political Reform Act. And that requires he, that he absolutely not participate in any decision, for uh, city decision, for which he has a potential conflict of interest. There is a limited exception under essentially letter rulings by the FPPC where involving your personal residence or personally owned property, not business owned property, not corporate owned property, but personally owned property. I believe Mr. Little was referring to his home where you can testify in front of another board, but you can't be in the room uh, prior to the uh, testimony and you have to leave the room uh, after the testimony. I believe the thinking of the FPPC there is that somehow even body language could potentially influence the body making the decision. That's their decision. So, uh, and like I say, I've advised Mr. Little of that uh, requirement. All right, well, Mr. Little, since, uh, since your body language might, um, you're, you're so powerful that your body language might tell us how to vote, I'm going to ask you a couple questions before beforehand. Um, one is, do you feel like this is uh, typical of other growers? Absolutely. Profit loss um, across dilemma. the board, and is the is the problem um, the 142, or is the problem that the growth that will uh, the, the percentage increase that will occur after the one 142 keeps on going up? Okay, all yes. right. Thank you. Okay, any other questions for Mr. Little? Yes, Madam Mayor, I just feel like I should add something. I, I don't this this position of the FPPC about not being in the room is not really far-fetched when you think no, about it. it. If, yeah. if it were a council member that had a conflict of interest We'd on something in front of the planning commission, they'd be allowed to testify, but yeah. they really wouldn't be allowed to sit there and sort of express their displeasure or their pleasure, if you will, right. at the planning commission. So it's, it is a, a legitimate concern. Let me give right. the council just a little history. I used to watch Gil Garcia hop up and go out the door when he had some problems to take up for the council, so I'll be delighted to be out in the hallway. And <laughs> call Thank me you. If, the, if during the discussion you want to ask a question. And I okay. Thank you guys. very much. Harriet Sharp. Oh, there you are. I did, couldn't see you sitting back there. Um, Madam Mayor and Councilman, my name is Harriet Sharp, and I'm an avocado grower in the Mesa area. And I I um, am also speaking to the dollar thirty two rate. Now, after your instructions in a city council meeting, 
the rate was sent back to the Water Commission, and they voted for the dollar thirty-two rate. And um, then they changed that a month later to um, tie it in with uh, sort of an arbitrary decision to tie it into uh, the wastewater. So. Um, the reason I feel very strongly about the dollar thirty-two rate is it's going to go up three and a half percent every year, and it's going to become very expensive. And um, you know, it's, it's just going to move up um, continuously so that it will add up to a lot, and that affects the growers. Now, I feel that um, these growers are important to Santa Barbara. And they provide open space and green and trees. I noticed you were excited about planting 318 trees. We're providing hundreds of trees, thousands of trees. Um, and I also feel it's very important to the environment. And I notice that that's also a concern of the council. So I'm pleased to hear that. Now, regarding the water rate, um, the percentage of my costs uh, in the last four years, I'll go back to 02, um, it was 74 percent. The water um, was 74 percent of my total costs for that year. And the following year, 03, it must have rained because it was only 44 percent. And then in um, 04, it was 60 percent. And last year it was 67 percent. So you get the idea that the water costs are a very significant portion. And since um, the vagaries of being a grower these days are difficult, if it's not weather affecting your crop, it's thrip, as you see on those alvica pests. Um, and so it's very difficult to come out ahead. And the water actually is. Um, probably three years out of four, um, about the same or more than my um, revenue from sales. So you can see why I feel strongly that it's a significant thing. And what I'm concerned about is not losing ag land. I just don't want to see the ag growers getting discouraged and having to give up and that land then becoming um, developed or taken out of um, things that are contributing to the environment. Um, any questions? Okay. Any questions? Yes, yes Mr. Barnwell. Um, did I understand you correctly that the Water Commission met on two different occasions? And the first meeting, they supported the $1.32 yes. one. And then at the yes. second meeting, they changed that opinion? Yes. Okay. And went to the $1.46 one? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Well, I have a question of staff after that. Okay, thank you. And I have no other speaker slips, uh, so it's to the council. Mr. May Barnwell, I, um, go ahead and follow. Mr. Mack, what, what's the explanation for that? Uh, Madam Mayor, Councilmember Barnwell, I believe Mr. Wiley wants to speak to that. Mr. Wiley. Uh oh. Good pun. Ma Madam Mayor. <laughs> Whoops. Whoops. Councilmember Barnwell, the reason for that was it was based on my advice, my suggestion that because uh, at the initial hearing, Mr. Little actively participated oh, in the discussion, okay. and uh, unbeknownst to me, and I and don't really know his situation, didn't know at the time, and then when I was advised of that, I advised that we really. Uh, that was inappropriate, but the best thing at this point would be to reset it for a new hearing in front of the commission. And then I met with Mr. Little and, and Mr. Mack, and we went over the, the Political Reform Act requir requirements uh, with Mr. Little and explained that he couldn't do what he had done previously. So we had that second hearing. And of course, that had nothing to do with uh, the decision of the commission. My, I didn't advise the commission at all how to decide the matter but simply that they have a second hearing with no participation on Mr. Little's part. Well, uh, Mr. Mack, that, that, that makes me want to know. Uh, what, what went on that convinced the commission to, to utterly reverse their original findings? Was it the swagger of Mr. Little that somehow caused them uh, to? Ms. Uh, Falcone was there, she says. 
Well, Are you I, the, I'm, uh, I'm still liaison to the oh, Water what, Commission. What were you there? I'm, I, I'm the liaison to the what Water happened? Commission, and um, okay. the initial, I think, one of the pieces that's being left out of this discussion that I think is is um, germane is that the staff recommendation going into that initial meeting was for a dollar sixty-two, and the Water Commission had a long conversation and then decided to uh, put it back to a, a, a date of 1995, I believe, which was a dollar thirty-two, at which point Mr. Wiley intervened and said um, that Mr. Little had participated in the conversation, that that decision essentially was voided, if you will, and then they met again and had uh, an additional conversation, which I was not part of, and that's where they came up with the 142. So staff was coming in recommending a dollar sixty-two. Um, after their conversation, they had decided to do this dollar thirty-two, uh, which they then subsequently changed at a meeting where I, I was not present. But that is, if I remember correctly, Mr. Mack, the uh, sequence of events, uh, just the sequence of facts. That is correct. Well, what happened at the second meeting, though, that caused them to go from a dollar thirty-two to a dollar forty-six? What was the change in the presentation, or the how did they? Wh why did they do that? Um, Madam Mayor, uh -huh. Councilmember yes, Barnwell, well, we would need the four voting members here to fully go through that again. But uh, there was some reconsider the at the second meeting, the uh, the Water Commission rescinded the action of the prior meeting, and then started the discussion again. Heard from staff, heard from public comment, and then discussed this amongst themselves. Uh, there was a a a feeling that the that moving the rate below from a dollar sixty two to something less was appropriate, uh, not unanimously, but uh, there was a majority that thought that was appropriate. There was not a majority who would vote for a dollar thirty two again, and so then there was a su substantial discussion of what would be the appropriate rate, and uh, it was settled that um, ninety percent of the recycled water rate was an appropriate um, uh, an appropriate rate to um, benchmark the uh, the recycled water rate uh, the some of the uh, well actually one of the uh, council members thought the dollar thirty two was a in my memory was uh, was arbitrary all these are arbitrary numbers and that we should have some Benchmark to that's uh, tied to other rates, and uh, the 90 percent uh, level was was settled upon. What was the staff's recommendation of the rate at the second meeting? Were you still holding to your higher number? The staff did not come in with a recommendation. We just provided information. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay, um, Mr. Williams. A couple questions. Um, Will it can will it increase 3.5 percent um, in your recommendations per this this graph per year, uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member mm -hmm. Williams? Um, well, that action was was the Water Commission on August 14th. Um, it is staff's intention, unless we're directed otherwise by uh, Council or the Water Commission. Um, to come in prior years with a 3.5% or whatever. In this coming uh, budget year, we will be re reviewing the water budget totally. We may be recommending something other than 3.5%, but that we would recommend that uh, across the board uh, rate increases in the future, whatever through in our budgetary process we come up with, um, we, we think it's a sense of the Water Commission and it is certainly staff's uh, current uh, direction that we would do across the board increases. Now, if we if we decided to freeze recycled water rates to incentivize the purchase of recycled water, would this there then freeze the ag rates as well? Um, well, uh, Madam Mayor, Councilmember Williams, um, I get based on this. Recommendation, it would, yes. So uh, when I when I first looked at this, just for the benefit of the council, I you know I thought a, a one forty two is is an okay rate in the scheme of things, but what I am a little bit cons concerned. Well, it's one forty two plus the three point five percent increase, which is one forty six. Um, 
what I um, because if you compare that with uh, surrounding agencies, it's 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 cheaper than two of the three of them, not by much, but cheaper than two of the three of them. But the thing I'm concerned about is if we is is the plan to increase that with a 3.5 percent increase every time. Uh, that is not. I've been watching water uh, ag water rates in surrounding jurisdictions. That is not the trend for across the board increases. Um, they are. Uh, tending, um, implored by the public, they, they are intending to raise residential rates at a different rate than ag rates. And so I, I would suggest uh, to the council that it m might be best to either start with the lower rate or to um, direct staff to that we're not interested in a 3.5 percent increase every year. Um, it's not a big revenue um, differential. Um, and I think that uh, the reason why I'm passionate about the subject is because I really think that we want a financial incentive to keep uh, agricultural um, uh, lands in the city and county in production. And we don't have control over all that much of the ag lands. We don't have much ag land left in the city of Santa Barbara. I think we should protect w what we have. Um, because generally the alternative is um, uh, types of development that are inappropriate giving, given the slopes of these kind of properties and given the fact that we want to keep um, our, our, our agricultural lands about, uh, for both for, for its beauty and for um, its, its product. Um, and the only real way to do that um, is to um, have a differential between uh, residential rates and, and ag, ag water rates, and I'll, I'm going to give you another layer of background. I, I, it doesn't matter to the city's bottom line. So the city did not include for itself this provision in the Kachuma agreement, but most of the signatories to the Kachuma agreement have a, a financial incentive to sell ag water because we all, all members of the Kachuma agreement do not pay interest on the loan to the Bureau of Reclamation on the ag water. We pay interest in in the ratio on the M&I water, essentially the residential and commercial water that we sell. So the reason why I give you that background is we save money as a uh, all the entities of the Kachuma Agreement save money um, by um, how much you know, ag water we sell as a ratio to, to, uh, um, uh, uh, to, to M and I. Okay, Mr. Schneider. Thank you. Correct me that in terms of an ongoing 3.5 percent increase over time, that would depend on what we do with the budget next year. It's the, today is establishing a particular rate that had a formula based as we see in the staff report, but it's not establishing that we'll go 3.5 percent forevermore. That's going to be part of the next two-year budget and the budget mm -hmm. after that and so forth. Is that correct? Madam Mayor, Council Member Schneider, yes. Okay. So to me, I think points well taken in terms of what do we want to do in the long term, but I think for today, uh, the, this has been certainly vetted enough through the Water Commission and back to us that there's one right now and what we do in the future is part of the whole bigger budget um, process that would start in the beginning of the year for the next two-year plan. So I'm, I think I'm supportive with the way this has come about. Yeah. So the discussion you're saying will happen with the next two-year plan in the spring, and that's, that, would be, that would be my thought, too. Okay, anybody else? Can I have a motion, then? Mr. One, one question. One thing that was not in the staff report is what is the current rate, Mr. Mack? Oh. You, you put in the, pro the original proposed rate and the... Uh, Two recommendations for what the rate is, but what what is the rate that we are we're selling them last year? At? Madam Mayor, Council Member mm -hmm. Williams, it's a dollar fifty six per HCF. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Mr. House hasn't spoken yet. Actually, I just want to be sure if I understand a dollar fifty six, and then it's ninety percent of that for the agricultural. No, it's. Um, Ninety percent of a dollar sixty-two. 
Okay. The dollar sixty-two the was, the, was what, which was what was in the budget before we sent yeah. it back to the water commission, and which is the re current recycled water rate. Right. Mm -hmm. And the one thirty-two number came is from originally from where? From history, um, it was <laughs> right. the uh, going back to nineteen ninety-five. That's when, old, when this old, class old, okay. was established. Okay. And what kind of feedback have we had from other um, agricultural users? Have we? Has there been a hue and cry? Is it? Is it? Is it uh, significant? Have, have you had great feedback from them about this change? Um, we have heard. F uh, I believe there are a total of four um, ag rate customers who came to either the mm -hmm. council meeting or the water commission meetings. Okay. Out of seventy-one. Right. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm concurring with the others on the. Uh, I think I am. What I heard so far, and that we have a process for vetting this kind of thing. We really want to honor that as much as we can at this point. Okay, Mr. Horton. I move recommendation B that we um, adopt a resolution of the City Council 6056 establishing rates for fiscal year 07. I'll second that. Okay, Mr. Um, Williams. Uh, Mr. Horton, would you uh, add a would you be willing to add a recommendation for increases of that as 2% as opposed to 3.5%? All right. Then I'm, I'm going to be against it. I, I think that the, the growth that what, are we, what we are going to see in surrounding jurisdictions is 2% two, 2 or less increases in ag water rates, and our ag water rates are going to be a lot higher pretty quick. Um, and I guess we could talk about that again at budget time, but I think that's a concern, I think a legitimate that, concern. Okay, and I will vote for it because I think that discussion is for this coming spring when we look at what we want for the right. coming year, uh, actually hopefully for a two-year plan. Um, Mr. Barnwell. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be opposing the motion just simply because I've done it before, and I did it for two years, and water was the hugest cost, and it caused me to get out of it. And it wasn't like I was making a lot at it, but I was kind of like these smaller operations that are being described to us. And, and since it's such a small portion of our budget, and we do an awful lot of things for, I don't know, these, <clears throat> these fringe elements in our community that need a little bit of financial help. And certainly agriculture has become, over time, a fringe group. And I just... Uh, uh, it, it's so small. I, it seems almost mean-spirited somehow to me, but I'm, I'm not in favor of the motion. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, it seems like we did give them a break, and that's why I'm voting for it. We gave them a break, 90% um, of the recycled rate, so I feel comfortable doing that. Okay. We called for the question. All those in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. No. Okay. So it's 5 to 2. Okay. Thank you very much. Item 13, please. Granada Garage, Anna Kappa Street Access. Okay. We have Mr. Nisich again. Thank you. Just give us a minute for everybody to get settled here. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council. Uh, I'm still Tony Nisich and the Public Works Director, but with me now is Brownie Allen, the Transportation uh, Division Manager, and we have uh, John Schof, uh, the noted John Schof, Principal Engineer from Engineering Group, and Tully Clifford, our Supervising Transportation Engineer. The item before you is to consider the, the discussion on uh, the Anacapa Street ad access to the Granada Garage. A little background you see up there in uh, fall of 2005, uh, staff discovered an error in the striping plans on the, on the uh, contract documents. At that time, we decided to move forward with the work as shown in the plans because we needed to. We had a we had a uh, firm under contract and needed to to make the decision. We also had an opening date that we had promised the community we wanted to deliver on, and we were going to put this uh, particular decision off to another date. Uh, we came back in February '06 and developed a process to review options to address this issue. Uh, we then uh, retained Watry to develop some options. Those options were then vetted by the various uh, committees and commissions, the Downtown Parking Committee, the Transportation Circulation Committee, the Historical Landmark Commission, and the Planning Commission. Uh, Mr. Brown will go over uh, the results of that. It's also included in your report. Uh, today we give you a recommendation what we think everything considered 
and so that other information uh, we're recommending that we we proceed with it with a restriping option and removal of the parking on the side in front of the um, the, the county administration building but with that, I'd let Mr. Browning go through the presentation. If we didn't take too long, and then we're, we're certainly available for questions. It's actually Mr. Allen, but that's okay. I do that all the time, too. Mr. Allen. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, just to give a perspective of what we're looking at, uh, this is the site of the Granada Garage, this is the old surface lot number six. Uh, we have Victoria Street and Anna Kappa Street, and here's Anna Pamu Street at the south. Uh, the dimensions of the street, this has been uh, some point of uh, discussion, is how come the city just didn't put the right turn lane in? Well, the reason is the dimension of the street prior to the construction of the garage was 36 feet, um, basically between Victoria Street and um, before the new, the old garage or the old parking structure, and again, 36 feet in front of the coffee cat at Anna uh, Pamu Street. We had 38 feet. There was a right turn pocket at the old lot six that allowed for uh, entrance into lot six, but it was only you know, from this portion to the entrance. It didn't continue all the way through to Anapamu Street. As uh, Mr. Nissitz mentioned, the striping plan that was contained in the construction document um, indicated a 38 foot width street, um, a 10 foot uh, right turn lane into the garage and exit lane, a 10 foot through lane and 18 feet, 8 feet for parking and then 10 feet for through. But as I mentioned earlier, we really don't have the dimensions. Uh, we need 38 feet to adequately put um, all those dimensions onto the street. So this is a uh, photograph showing what the Granada Garage and Anacapa Street looks like today with the construction completed for the Granada Garage. You can see here in the um, circled area, that's the old right turn lane into oh. <laughs> the uh, old lot six that was blacked out and will be removed when we uh, slurry seal the street in a, in a few weeks. So I'm going to go briefly go through the options that were under consideration. There were uh, seven options that were discussed with the various advisory boards and I'll discuss the recommendations when I complete the uh, review of these options. So the first option was removing uh, the curb on the west side near the garage and taking it all the way up to Victoria Street and put and putting the right turn lane in. This gives a different, a closer look up of what that would uh, look like. You know, you know, there are issues with this option and what, what are those issues? Why you know, can't we just go ahead and, and do that? Well, there's an 11th inch difference between the top of sidewalk and top of curb. If you add in the six foot um, curb to the top of the street, we have 17 inches. So we have a tripping uh, hazard here. If you look at extending the lane all the way down to Victoria, uh, to Annapamu Street, you put the 11 uh, inch difference. You know, we would probably have to put some type of retaining and some type of restraint to not let pedestrians step off from the curb and, and into the street and potentially creating a, a tripping hazard. So staff did not at, uh, pursue this option any further. We did not ask Watry to cost that out because it was not uh, feasible. We had some ADA issues, great issues that would make it very challenging to really make this uh, work and function properly. Second option was re relocating the curb on the east side, the county side of the, uh, the street. We would be able to put the right turn lane into the garage and restripe the street. And <coughs> So this photograph here shows currently we have an 11 foot sidewalk on the county side. In order to um, accommodate um, a two foot adjustment, we move the curb in two feet. These trees here would have to be relocated into this area here. Um, obviously we would ask the county to trim their, their bushes here so we'd have adequate <laughs> sidewalk width. Right. But we would be able to accomplish that and still have adequate sidewalk width in this section of the, of the, uh, the street. Uh, we would have to reconstruct the driveway in front of the, uh, that's the exit for the county uh, offices. However, you notice the stripe here, uh, it represents where the curb, new curb would be constructed. It's going right through these mature uh, trees. There are three mature trees here, and they're healthy trees. Uh, so we didn't really feel it was appropriate to recommend removing three healthy trees if they, you know, if not needed to, to do that. 
Option three was relocating both the east curb and the west curb one foot on each side uh, to get the adequate uh, width that shows what the striping plan would look like. Again, with this option, we still have a similar uh, grade challenges, ADA uh, access issues, not as severe as with the option one where we were taking the two feet on the garage side, but, but still a concern, still design challenges. And again, engineering did not ask the watch tree to cost this item out because we didn't feel it was uh, feasible to pursue this because of the, uh, some of the uh, grade differentials. Op uh, I'm not gonna go option number four, remove the parking on the east side and relocate the curb. This option is a little different from uh, the previous option where we're talking about relocating the curb towards the center line of the street. So m moving it from the curb in four feet, this will be allow the creation of a landscape parkway similar to what we've created over in front of the garage. So we would duplicate what, what has been done in front of the garage of the garage in front of the county side. Uh, option five is, reloc is removing the parking um, on the county side in its entirety and just restriking the street doesn't require any physical reconstruction of any of the curbs this this uh, third ceiling the street and painting and repainting the stripes the sixth option that was discussed with uh, was the putting a turn pocket in in front of the garage so what this would do is uh, a turn pocket that's roughly 55 feet from the entrance um, back towards the, um, the entrance to the parking offices. With this option, approximately two, maybe three cars would be able to queue in this area uh, to <coughs> access the garage. Um, this was discussed in, in quite detail, and we've taken a closer look at this. And, you know, there have been concerns I mean, before we redid the driveway to make it a little easier to, to turn into. But now we're putting the cars uh, two feet closer, possibly three feet closer to the garage. And, you know, we put a turning template on, on the drawings, and there will be occasions where cars will not be able to make the turn into the garage, creating a situation where they're going to have to back up uh, to get the curb. So that would create more of a problem we're trying to, to uh, correct by doing that. Just a closer look at the uh, turn pocket. And the final option that was considered was just wait and see, do nothing at this point in time, wait and see, see if we have a queuing problem. If so, then we can come back with uh, making some changes to it. Um, we have been observing it for... Um, since March, uh, haven't really experienced very many queuing problems, but, but we see some benefits of doing some other things um, on the street. So we did go before the four uh, committees and commissions. Uh, the reason we went before the HLC and Planning Commission is the Planning Commission, they approved the project. Uh, the Historic Landmarks Commission, they had a role in the aesthetic and the look of the garage, and there was concerns about what we might uh, propose doing to uh, correct the, the situation. Um, obviously, the uh, parking committee is responsible for uh, the parking management program, and we want the input from the transportation circulation committee, you know, from a circulation standpoint. The historic landmarks commission was this: wait and see, see if there really is a problem, and if there is a problem, let's put the turn pocket in. You know, after we went before them, we discovered that this might not be the best uh, solution. The uh, TCC, you know, recommended this removal of the parking in front of the county side and just restrike the street. The Planning Commission, their recommendation was to relocate the curb on the county side and then restrike the street. And the Parking Committee um, at their last meeting have recommended that the removal of the parking and then restriping the street. So staff's recommendation uh, today before council is just removal of the parking on the 1200 block of Anacapa Street, restrike the street uh, to provide for the um, right turn lane into and exiting the garage. You know, we've discussed this in some detail, and we feel the, the major benefit by doing this will inc improve the exiting from the garage more so than the entrance. You know, the queuing analysis that was done by the designers prior to start of construction. So the queuing problem really is for cars waiting to get out of the garage rather than getting in. So we'd be able to strike a, a protective exit lane, you know, however the cars will have to turn right onto Anna Pamu Street, but at least be able to ease the flow for vehicles being e able to exit the garage. And we've heard some comments from uh, members of the parking committee about the difficulty at certain times of the day, primarily the afternoon peak hour of exiting the garage. So this will be able to help improve that a little bit. We've, this can be done. We currently have a slurry sill contractor on board right now. He's slurry sealing the streets. He's 
he will be doing these streets in the next couple of uh, weeks. And so this will be a minimal cost to the city. The primary cost to the city to uh, do this will be any, either red curbing the street in front of the county or changing out the, uh, the signs to no parking rather than the 75 minute parking. You know, there was concerns about, well, losing 13 to 14 parking spaces in front of the county. Uh, Telly Clifford, our supervising transportation engineer, has been analyzing the curb markings in the downtown core and has made some changes already in the area. I'm looking at some additional changes. But over here on Santa Barbara Street and Anna, at Anna Pamu Street by the county courthouse, he has been able to add uh, four 75-minute spaces. Over on Victoria Street, there were uh, two white zones, a loading zone, passenger loading zones. Those have been converted to 75-minute spaces. But further down on, on Victoria Street, uh, on the other side of State Street, uh, two 15-minute uh, two white zone spaces have been converted to two 15-minute spaces, and then we have uh, three 75-minute spaces that have also been created over on, on this location. Those are already in place right now. Streets completed those a, a couple of days ago, so and we, we're looking for additional opportunities to add additional parking within a couple of block radius of the ground of the garage. That concludes my uh, presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions the council might have. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have eight speakers who would like to talk. Does, do you have a question, Mr. Or do you want me to go ahead? I have a question. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Horn. Um, that uh, structure is constructed with uh, two exits? Th that's correct. Right. And um, I know there's construction going on, but it, is it possible to have the Annapamu Street exit open more hours um, when I'm over there visiting around, I, I don't see much going on, and I see the exit closed. Maybe that's just a personal observation, but, I mean, is, is there a reason to have that exit closed so many hours a day, and if that were open, would that improve the situation? Well, to answer your second question, definitely would improve the situation. We know that we'll be able to um, queue about eight cars on the Annapamu Paseo when it does open, fully open, you know, when the theater completes their construction. The, ex the entrance is currently open, is being utilized, you know, but they do have construction vehicles. I was there this morning. I went out there this morning just to have one more look-see before today's council meeting, and there was a cement truck that showed up to deliver a load, so it was in the way, so I couldn't enter that way. I had to go around the block. Um, but when we do see a queuing problem uh, for exiting on Anna Kappa Street, staff will go out, see if there's any construction activity, and we will open it up to uh, free out the lot. Uh, we do have an agreement with the theater, and John can go with that in a little more detail to when they can and cannot or will or will not open the Annapamu Paseo to the city, and John can go with that in a little more detail. Okay, Mr. Shu. Uh, Madam Mayor, Councilman Horton, the uh, difficult part of that construction is that they're going to be building um, quite a, a wall that's going to be going straight up in the back there, and to put cars through the, that entrance while they're building that wall um, is really going to put those cars in harm, harm's way because um, they're going to be using a lot of cement. They're going to have a lot of things over over top there. So the idea was is to get the contractor to finish that as soon as he possibly can and then open the entire entrance. Um, and I think that's due. Um, they were talking about about a six month period, and that was about a month ago. So I well, you know that may be the case, but when one visits cities around as we did just last week in San Diego, you see construction going on of that nature or even a lot higher and you see cars going in and out right next to it so it doesn't really make sense to me. Okay. Yeah, and may I add also that uh, we do have a commitment from the contractor that the Anapumu entrance and exit will be available for this year's holiday shopping season. You know, that was something that was really important to the merchants in that area so they have made that commitment to the city. Right. Mr. House, did you have a question? Yes, I have two. Um, one of them uh, uh, Actually, while we're doing this, could you put up the slide that shows, was your last slide that showed the intersection of um, Annapamu and Anacapa looking up the street, the last slide that had a, a streetscape right there. So um, right there we see these two through lanes and the dedicated right-hand turn lane. And what's the, the width of the street right there is the same as the width of the street um, ahead of the uh, entrance to the to the parking garage, correct? 
And so my question really goes to why not stripe the street the same as you see it right there um, in front of the garage? If you'll notice in the picture, you'll notice that the center line is actually shifting over to the east. Mm -hmm. We're actually, we've done that to accommodate the turns at the, this particular intersection. The difficulty we've encountered doing that is that you'll notice the Volkswagen van and the car behind it, those two spaces are prone to side swiping. We need to remove those to even accommodate this in this particular circumstance. So that's why we can't do it along the entire length of the street because we just, we don't have the width. So we've tried to do it at the intersection to gain some capacity there. We left the green spaces there during the construction in order, because of the removal of all the parking, so we sort of hedged our bets a little bit to try and gain some temporary parking, but it's not a hedge we want to carry through permanently. I understand. And then the um, other question, thank you very much, Tully. The other question is, um, do we have a problem? I mean, you've, it's been posed before, and I didn't hear the answer. Uh, do we have a queuing problem? I mean, is there a problem? Well, during the uh, Fiesta, this year's Fiesta, uh, the garage was fully operational. During the events, we were 80 cars shy of being at full capacity you know, for some of the events that were being held at the Sunken Gardens. Both it, the entrances were fully operational, and we did not see a queuing problem for people getting into the garage. We did see some queuing problem for the exit in the garage, but in terms of entering the garage, uh, there was not a queuing problem. And you have multiple, two different ways to exit the garage, or only one way to exit the garage? We, have, we will eventually we will have two ways to exit the garage. During Fiesta, we did have both exits as well as entrances open. Okay, so it's safe to say that at least up to now, even including at Fiesta, we have with 80% full garage, we haven't seen a problem. That's correct. Thank you. The only thing that hasn't been talked about at all is I'm always getting stuck and I just get in the wrong lane, I guess, behind people that are trying to parallel park along there. It drives me crazy because I, I really. I mean, I stop and wait for them and everything, but I just feel like, and some people take a long time, time trying to parallel park on the left side of the street, and I understand why, because they're right-handed and all that, but, but it, it is a special skill. But still, uh, that parallel parking is a problem, and I'm, I'm just throwing that into the mix for to be on right here. But it's really the truth. Now, that, that was discussed extensively at the last downtown parking. Oh, was it? Okay. Okay, that that weighed there, into their recommendation to council okay. on removal of the parking. Okay, we have eight speakers. Uh, we'll start with Dale Francisco. And don't forget to agree or disagree and watch the clock up there, please. There we go. Madam Mayor, council members, I'm Dale Francisco, Secretary of Santa Barbara State Streets. We're here today because after the construction of the Granada Garage was well underway, it was discovered that the designers had got the width of Anacapa Street wrong. And unfortunately, Public Works didn't catch that problem. At that point, the garage was large enough we couldn't move it. So our only choices involve modifications to the existing curbs, sidewalks, landscape, and parking on Anacampa. It was a little bit unclear to me from Public Works' uh, report when exactly the seven possible solutions had been arrived at. But clearly, over the last several months, these seven possible solutions have been discussed by the four groups that we were talking about, Planning Commission, et cetera. And it's only now, at the last minute, that Public Works comes before you and says, oh, four of those solutions that we've been talking about for all these months actually won't work. Oops. Now, obviously, Council is under no time pressure right now to make a decision about this. There's not a queuing problem at the moment. We of Santa Barbara State Streets think there will be once the Granada Performing Arts Center opens next year, but right now it's not an issue. If you value the expertise and the judgment of the Planning Commission and the other groups that have spent so much time discussing this topic, we respectfully suggest that you direct staff not to short circuit the discussion, but rather to prepare what we hope will be a final report listing all of the possible options for fixing this problem, also detailing why the previously discussed solutions will now not work, that this report be made available to the public, and that you benefit from the input of the organizations who you've tasked to make these kinds of decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Westby will be followed by Eric Kelly. Mayor and Council, good afternoon. 
Uh, I just can't help make a comment about the performance report that uh, uh, the city administrator made today. I thought it was absolutely terrific, and I would encourage you to continue. Um, uh, Councilman Snyder and I had a little discussion about uh, benchmarking, which we call it in the business world, yeah. comparing to, to other cities. Anyway, uh, one of the things that, that we do in the business world is when somebody makes a mistake, we do lessons learned, find the root cause, and then implement, impl make sure that that's implemented uh, so that you don't make the mistake again, and that's how we get better and better and better. Uh, the other thing that we do is when somebody approves something with a certain design intent, we do everything we can to meet that design intent and not sub-optimize some decision. Uh, you approved that we were going to have a right-hand turn lane when this garage was approved, and we were going to continue with the parking. Uh, and I think that it just makes sense that we try to achieve that design intent, if at all possible. Now, we wouldn't expect you to tear the county building down to achieve a right-hand turn lane. That wouldn't make any sense. But if there's a reasonable solution, and I'm a tree guy, so I hate to have you remove the trees, but if that's the only solution that you can do to remove the trees, it's a renewable resource. We can plant more trees. They will grow, and they will beautify the city. So I, I, uh, I hope and encourage you to take that in consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Eric Kelly to be followed by Michael Self. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Eric Kelly. I'm the owner of the Book Den at 15 East Annapamu Street. I oppose the recommendation as it's phrased. I'm going to go through, i got a lot to say very quickly, so do not do nothing. There actually is a problem, and the problem really is the queuing to exit it. A couple weeks ago, I had the privilege of paying a dollar and a half to spend 10 minutes in line to get out of that lot. This was at 2 o'clock in the afternoon in a garage that is nowhere near full to capacity. What's it going to be like uh, when that op um, garage is operating at full capacity? And the real problem is, is that people exiting the garage are forced to turn into 40-mile-an-hour traffic coming down Anacapa Street. What happens is, is that they wait for the light, and they're wise to do so. But that means you get two, three, maybe four cars out of the garage per light, and the rest of us are queuing back there. Uh, next, do not sacrifice par parking. Uh, the spaces in the garage cost $70,000 a piece. And if you eliminate 16 spaces on Anacapa Street, and I know the number varies, but if it was 16, it's $972,000 worth of parking that you're throwing away. It's almost a million dollars. Uh, they did not discuss what the um, expense of the various options are, but uh, earlier in the conversation we heard that the expense of removing the sidewalk in front of the county administration building and moving everything over to uh, two feet was $250,000, which is about 1% of the cost of the garage. And that's what, how little it will cost you to get it right. And after 15 years of lobbying for this garage and two years of construction, I think those of us in that area deserve to get it right. Uh, and I'm, you know, don't give away parking spaces. And I, I hate to see people using the excuse that uh, we've already um, uh, built 570 spaces, and it's really only a net gain of 360 spaces, and it sets a bad precedent because the county is going to be coming and asking to lease the bottom floor of that garage for their employees, and next year, uh, Mr. Olney, the county architect, is going to come and ask to do away with all of the parking surrounding the courthouse, and they're all going to say, well, we got this parking garage now, and you're going to keep spending the parking until we have no net gain whatsoever. And I want to remind you that that garage fills less than one-fourth of the parking deficit in the north of Creo area that we've been waiting for. Uh, well, this is the first new parking construction since uh, Richard Nixon was president. So I urge you to fix it right. One uh, suggestion I just thought of on the option of moving the uh, curb over is to preserve the uh, mature trees on the east side of the street and just in that end of the walk, take uh, the two feet off of the west side of the street, up near the church on the corner of uh, Victoria. And uh, then you would get uh, the width you need by stealing a little from each side of the block, and uh, the tra traffic engineers can probably figure out whether that's feasible or not. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael Self, followed by Krista Frizen.
Madam Mayor and Council members, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Michael Self. I'm president of Santa Barbara Safe Streets. He took all my information, not all of it, but to summarize, if it was 13 spaces and that it cost you $910,000 to build those spaces, why are we throwing them out when the fix, I had 240 as the highest, even if it's 250, the net savings to the community is $670,000. That is significant. We're talking about finite resources in both cases. When I see the slide that shows the places they've squeezed in here and there, we all know when you go downtown that there must have been a sale on red paint because we are losing parking left and right that is just disappearing from the scene. And that is troubling to our group, too. And one thing, a little off topic, but I would like to see that turning template applied to the bulb outs that are proposed throughout the city and see how that turning template works. Thank you very much. Thank you. Krista Fritzen from Coffee Cat. Ah, there she is, followed by Marsha Rose. Hi, Krista. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, my name is Krista Fritzen, and my husband and I own Coffee Cat right at the corner of Anacap and Anapamu. And I'm here to tell you that um, I am definitely uh, do not like the idea of the on-street parking being eliminated on the east side of the 1200 block of Anacapa. And this is because it will definitely have a very negative impact on our business. Um, I would like to explain just how important the issue of street level parking along Anacapa is. Our business relies on customers perceiving us as a fast, convenient coffee stop on their way to other places around town. Um, this, in a lot of people's minds, requires on street parking. Um, particularly the spots along Anacapa Street, people like to just pop in and out. Many of you might think that the Granada Garage would be a convenient option. Um, however, as it was reported in the Santa Rosa News Press, and as we've heard today, um, less people are parking in the garage now than we're using the surface level parking lot that was there before. Um, I think that it's a psychological, I don't want to enter and deal with the kiosk. That's just my personal opinion. We see firsthand our customer's preference for street level parking and in preliminary parking surveys we, that we're just kind of doing on the fly, we estimate that 60 to 70 people a day use the street parking near the shop even with the newly completed garage next door. I, it's a cup of coffee and a bagel, just not worth the hassle of navigating a multi-story garage. I, I think when people have more of a reason to stay in the neighborhood, that's when the garage is, you know, is a good choice. But for our particular business, it's not, a, a lot of people will not park there. So if half of those 60 to 70 people that are currently using street level parking decide to pass us by um, for a more convenient coffee elsewhere, that would equate to a 36 to a 4,500 dollar loss of sales for us a month, which is 43 to 54 thousand dollars a year, um, and you can imagine what that does to a small business, new business owners. We won't make it. If the decision to eliminate the Anna Kappa Street parking is made, Coffee Cat will be the hardest hit by a situation that we did not create, and I urge you to empathize with local business and extend a helping hand to, in allowing us to get every advantage we can in this very competitive marketplace. Um, as far as the presentation that was given here, I am um, the number two option of that requires the relocation of some trees. I too don't like the idea of trees dying, but this is our business 
and these are trees that can possibly be replanted somewhere else, I would really like to see that option further explored. Okay, you've um, gone way over. Can okay. you, you see the clock up there? No, no look right you. there. I'm sorry, I've never done this before. I, I know, I know, that's why I'm showing you where it is. Okay. But go ahead and finish up. I, that sorry. was actually it. Oh, so thank <laughs> sorry. You. That's okay. Sorry. Uh, Marshall Rose, followed by Rich Enderman. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mayor Bloom and Council Members. I'm Marshall Rose, and I'm before you this, this afternoon uh, as in my role as Chair of the Downtown Parking Committee. I would uh, first like to address uh, one of the options and then explain a little bit of the Downtown Parking Committee's thinking and also what I heard at the Transportation and Circulation Committee. I think it has some bearing on this. First of all, I think the wait and observe op option should be taken off the table. It's taken about four months through the process to get here today. We have observed. It's not working. It's not a queuing problem. There's queues once in a while, two or three cars and trucks backing up behind them. We have an exiting problem. We cannot defend the exit. It's simple. I don't know what the speed of the other cars are. All the drivers are different. Some are timid when they go out. Some want to go all the way across to turn left on Annapamu Street. I have been in the garage on several occasions when you cannot get out. Everybody's blaring their horn. One day it was 20 minutes. Part of the problem is because of the Annapamu Street exit not being there. I see it more as a problem of people not being able to get out smoothly, even with the uh, underutilized Granada Garage is, smoothly out onto Anacapa Street. As one car goes out, as it breaks, you still need to have a transaction to get the next car up to the line. So maybe there's two ready to go when the light clears. There is a defense problem there. I think the turn lane will provide that defense, and that's what we need to look at. How do we do it? The uh, Downtown Parking Committee came down on the quickest solution. Get that turn lane in now. Restripe, take advantage of the slurry ceiling. That was the, that was the solution. I was not in the majority of that decision. I think we need to keep the parking spaces. The Planning Commission made a very studied decision five, six years ago when they designed this. We needed a turn lane and we needed to keep the parking. It's very valuable. Those parking spaces are extremely valuable whether you put the dollars and cent pieces on them or what they mean to commerce. Uh, part of the circulation element, the parking chapter of the circulation element is says something to the effect, add on street parking when the opportunity presents itself. It doesn't say about taking it away. My suggestion would be is to authorize the option um, five, the uh, restriping option to remove the parking now and then charge the Public Works Department to design this with the cooperation of the county to move the sidewalk back and either find funding through Public Works, uh, RDA, or parking to return the parking there by reducing the county uh, sidewalk on the east side of Anacapa Street. But first and foremost, I think we need the turn lane in now. Um, the Transportation and Circulations Committee decision was to restripe, but their suggestion was is to the parking that you remove from the county side to put it on Annapamu Street. But a decision that they made a couple of weeks after that is not to return the parking on, a, on to Annapamu mm -hmm. Street obviated that decision. So their, their decision, the way I heard it, was to remove the parking but to move it around the corner. They're not going to be able to do that. So I would just suggest... Um, Restripe it now, get a turn lane in, and then look at the option of returning the parking there. It's extremely valuable to those businesses to there and to the county business, the in and out business. And those are cars that are very difficult to get in and out of the garage, and um, I think that this other solution would be better. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rich Enderman. And then the last speaker will be Tom Williams. And you're all doing a pretty good job at staying within the two minutes here. Let me get Hi, thanks for letting me talk. I'm always pleased with the number of ideas and opinions that come up. I think uh, in this one, uh, the, um, the issue that's not been talked about at all is the pedestrian vitality of this corner. It's an incredibly dense pedestrian area with people moving from and to the county administration building. There's an art gallery in there. You pay your taxes in there. There's all kinds of public activities that happen. There is no better enhancer of safety on a sidewalk than a row of parked cars. The row of parked cars, and you, you folks did this on Chapala quite correctly, I think, the other day. The row of parked cars, 2,000 pounds to 10 between you and that car moving 
Uh, Marty is right. Uh, when you, uh, Mayor, Madam Mayor, excuse me. Thank you. Um, when you uh, park, uh, it does slow traffic down. That's what you want in a downtown. You don't want that road zooming along there at 35 miles an hour. Your speed limit is 25. The park cars slow traffic. It enhances the pedestrian activity. This uh, um, couple back here with the coffee shop benefit enormously from slower moving traffic and from pedestrian safety and pedestrian vitality. I don't know what the answer is, but it sure seems like right now you don't have a problem. It works, just as uh, Councilman House has, has, has mentioned, uh, and that you can uh, can let it go. There are possibilities if, um, if, if the last speaker is right and the real problem is exiting, this is not an exit solution. This is an entry solution. And if it's an exiting problem, then maybe what you need to do is look at internal ways inside the garage Pay early so you just get a ticket and you don't have to wait in line there. Have a, a, a police officer that lets you get out faster, stop and go lights, etc. This is set up for exiting uh, fairly well. We're a tight corridor. You don't need a 100% uh, engineering solution. You need a kind of middle of the road one that, that uh, deals with all of the issues. Thanks for letting me talk. Thank you, Rich. Uh, Tom Williams will be the last speaker. Madam Mayor, Council, I'm Tom Williams, and I'm the last member of the uh, Parking Committee. Uh, one anecdote that, that fell right into my lap. I, 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 thank you very much. You, I didn't script it with you, uh, Mr. Barnwell. Uh, we are the Stealth Committee, as I've talked to you about. We're one of the few uh, City Council-appointed uh, advisory committees that aren't on television. Nobody knows about us except us and you. So... Uh, <laughs> It would help immensely if you people could look in the future and get us on television. We're in a room that's equipped for it, and why it isn't on television like everybody else. If you want to, if you want to talk about a tree getting adjusted, it's on television and repeated innumerably. We are stealth committee. His comments would have been avoided had he been able to see us. I appreciate that. Second anecdote is, uh, as I was coming here today, I came down Anacapa deliberately. And being a member of the committee, I paid attention as I went across the uh, Anacapa by the garage. And there was a car waiting to get out. Now, I don't know how long that person had been waiting to get out. It was a car full of people. There was no way to get out. There was a steady stream of traffic, including me. So I stopped, and I waved in the windshield to let the person out. I thought they were going to get out and kiss me. Every one of them in a the car, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And they got out. There's a city pickup truck behind them. I want to see that. <laughs> For all I know, that city pickup truck is still sitting there waiting to get out. I don't think so. The idea that we don't have a problem and that it's anecdotal, we got by Fiesta and all that stuff. I don't know where that story came from, but my observation, as well as the others, that do nothing is really not an option. Okay. I'm here today, and I think you probably have all figured out that there are no good options. If there were good options, they would have been accomplished a long time ago. There aren't. There's just a bunch of bad options, and you're going to earn your money today by picking the least damaging of one of the bad options. I don't think that's the way things should be, but that's the way things are. Thank and you. On the committee, I happened to be in the majority vote when we voted to take the least expensive option and merely remove the traffic and restripe the street. Because we were in the majority does not necessarily mean we had the least damaging of the options. Like I said before, there are no good options. Marshall was in the minority, and that does not mean that his idea wasn't the least damaging. Uh, they both have good arguments. If you take uh, our argument and just move the traffic out of there, you get rid of your your problem with the people parking parallel and plugging up the street, but you get rid of 13, 14 spots, and there were somewhere around a million dollars, and you've got to take that into consideration. If you move the curb in and uh, re uh, retain the parking, then you got the question of how much is that going to cost, and we've heard, you know, who knows, 250, 500,000, whatever it is, and that's an option. So 
we we the majority of our committee voted to just move the parking and restripe the street because it would accomplish something right away and it's uh, low cost and it is certainly better than doing nothing okay. so i urge you to make an unpopular decision make a decision that really you know there's flaws in it but you don't have much other choice and i urge you to make a decision today that will help us because doing nothing is i don't think something you should consider thank you thank you it's good to be record to know well, what's going on here it's it's not easy um, so it's to the council and and um, gee my husband's occupation they say do no damage but I don't think that's true here so <laughs> well, do no harm that's right um, so let's start with mr. house Thank you, and thank you, uh, Mr. Williams, for that. Uh, it's levity, but it's really true. <laughs> I mean, it just turns out sometimes you just do your very best. And um, uh, clearly, from my question with uh, staff, um, uh, it was to look and see if there really isn't a solution that requires us to do nothing. I mean, that'd be kind of cool if it would work out. But then I do remember the difficulties in getting out, and and we have all experienced it at this point. And I then remembered further back when I was on planning commission and we made the requirement for a turning lane and we didn't anticipate this problem. We honestly thought the street was wide enough to be able to accomplish the, the thing. I also remember when we put together and just recently approved the pedestrian master plan and parking on the street on a busy street um, like this is a real amenity for pedestrians. It protects them. It actually uh, provides a buffer and there's a, there's some real positive benefit for that. Um, I'm, uh, remember now watching different ones of the committees as they went through and each took a different perspective. The perspective that I, I be careful how I say this, but I, I really respect the, the Planning Commission's um, role, which is to look out mo the most broadly and look at the, the depth of the situation. So what they've recommended to us is uh, not only appropriate for pedestrians, appropriate for parking, appropriate, appropriate for the turn, turning movements, but also aesthetically more pleasing in that it allows for trees to be replanted in the wells using the adequate width sidewalk. And I just really think uh, Marshall Rose is uh, on the right track with supporting that. And I know that the, um, uh, the um, the idea somehow of phasing this, I don't know if it is necessary. We certainly have an opportunity to get the street striped uh, at the same time as this, uh, as a slurry seal is being done and, and have something right away. But boy, if that ended up stuck like that, I think we would end up with a much more stark streetscape if we had no parking there and we just had the lanes and it would become a faster pace block, even though we phase the lights, it still would become a faster paced block, which is not in the direction we want to go, especially not with people crossing at right angles here at this intersection. So I think the Planning Commission got it right, and I support the Planning Commission's um, point of view, and uh, when it comes time, I'd be willing to make that motion, but I want to hear what the others have to say. But is the Planning Commission to move the curb? Yes. There, okay, let's side? just go back to what theirs is, and, and staff can help us, but my understanding is that it puts the turning lane that's been needed to get in with queuing room. Yeah, here it comes up. Well, I didn't. Um, it I didn't. has the. It puts the curb back on the on I the know. county side. My question to you is different than what you're answering, and I appreciate you trying to answer it all. But my question to you is, um, they wanted to do that, but but you're also saying that Marshall Rose had the right idea, and that is take off the parking in the meantime and do the slurry seal, and then work this out with the county. Is I'm that what saying you're that saying? he supports this, and uh, and I do too. And then the question of phasing it, whether you would actually do a just restripe right now and remove the parking, that's something that I I would be concerned about doing that if it meant we never got to this. Right. But so as, this is what I'm supporting right here. Okay, Ultimately, this is, that's what, what I meant support. to say. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Um, just real quickly, the three closed sessions that we have after this, um, it's up to us to decide if we want to put them off or hear them. I don't think any of them is very long. It's they're like 15 minutes, 10 minutes, and 10 minutes. Um, do you want to go ahead and still? We have, the reason I'm saying this is we have Rich Gloss waiting in the back, and we have uh, Mark Howard and, and others. Um, do you want to go ahead with it, or are you okay Madam with Madam Mayor, that? can yes. I add, there's no particular reason they have to be done today. I know, I know. So that's the question up to the council. You want to go ahead and do them? Next week, okay? Okay. 
go give him the good news. I should have done that a little bit earlier. Thank you. Mr. House, I wasn't trying to, I was just trying to get clear which, what we're doing. No, I didn't understand your question. I appreciate yeah, yeah. that. No, I support Planning Commission's recommendation, and I think that that's that where Mr. Marshall wants to see us go, and I referenced him that way. Yeah, that's all. okay. And the thank question you. is how do you get there? And that's right. Yeah. That question okay. is up in the air. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Falcone, we'll just go down the line. Everybody's lights on. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, I think the answer is, you know, speed bumps and bulb out and, you know, and all that. No. Let's start doing that on your Block it off. No. <laughs> um, um, I did get you a message one. from the coffee cat. Um, you didn't leave a number, so I didn't call you back. But I'm glad you were here in person to speak because I was going to reference you in my conversation. But don't need to because you said it all. I, you know, the, the entry problem... I, I don't think anybody here, I didn't hear any consensus around the issue of there is an entry problem. It sounds to me like everybody has come to at least the current um, conclusion that there is no entrance getting in problem, especially since both of them are open most of the time. I used the Anna Pamu one the other day, and it's um, a little weird with all the construction, but, you know, certainly it works. Well, um, and in that same moment, I was caught in a very long line trying to get out. So when you say that there's an exiting problem, I don't think that there's any doubt here that I've heard that that's true as well. The other thing that's really true is that the parking is incredibly valuable, is used by a whole host of folks from people who go into the coffee cat to people who go into the county building for 15 minute or whatever happens to be a uh, time where they pop in and out and to pop in and out of that garage is not is not as easy to navigate so that is also true so we have a number of things that are that are true here the concern that I have with Mr. Rose's suggestion is that as we all know once you either put something in or you take it away, it remains in that status. It is either gone or it is there. And um, the one exception being the one roundabout that you took out, Mr. Clifford. But I I'm concerned, very concerned, that if we take the parking away, um, that it will never return. And I can't vote for something that has that as one of the options. So um, if there's a way, could you go back to that last photo you had up for quite some time? I guess it's option, yeah, that, um, that'll do. <laughs> the, the point is, if the exiting is the problem, and I can't help but believe that to some extent that will be addressed when the Annapamu side is opened. However, the issue of trying to get out into, you know, really fast moving traffic and timing that or waiting for the light when it's safer. I waited for the light the other day and several times when I've been in. So I'm no engineer, but my question as a layperson is, is there a way to address the exiting problem without creating an auxiliary lane all the way down the street to the corner of Victoria? Is there a way to address that issue of coming out? Now, maybe, as you said, the two spaces there with the green 15 minutes, the van and the car behind it, are temporary, if I understood you correctly, Mr. Clifford, um, anyway. And does that do something to the geometry, to the dynamics? I'd like to be able to address the truths. Exiting is a problem, and parking needs to remain. So help me out, please. Thank you for the simple question. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Clifford. I think, My pleasure. I think if we look at it in component parts, there's several things that can be done here to address several of the issues that have been raised. One of the ones I heard was the, trying to save the mature trees, not the palm trees, but the other trees at the end. If we look at it as more of an exiting issue rather than an entry issue, we can look at doing transitioning after those trees mm -hmm. and so we can look at doing the shifting then towards the county after that point and so we can we can accomplish that safely with the transitioning because we're talking a two perhaps a three foot transition only and at the appropriate speed on the streets that will work so that part's rather easy if we look then at at the other end at the Annapamu and the uh, 
and a kappa end where we want to have a little bit more room to maneuver on the turns at, at that end there. We need that transition to be longer because we're doing sort of a double transition or a weave even. In other words, the people who are leaving the, the garage aren't necessarily staying in the right turn lane and turning right onto Annapamu Street. They're trying to weave and they're trying to move. And so we're trying to give them, so what you're asking is can we get them then safely out of the garage? And I think we can, but we can't do it unless we strip back all the parking from the, the in essence, the exit point of the garage towards Annapamu or gain that two feet okay. of space. On that point right there, something that has not been brought up, which may be completely lunatic from an engineering point of view, I don't know, but from a person who has done lots and lots of business at the county, at the courthouse, understands that corners, I think we all really do. One of the things that is also true is that when you park in that garage and you exit, you're not going to the corner to cross to the administration building. Some people jaywalk. Not I, certainly. But the point is, is there's an exit door right there at the Anacapa side of the administration building, which many, 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 many people use to not only just exit the building, but to go across the street and to enter either the garage or even the coffee cat or to walk up to Cadario, give them a plug to. Um, I'm wondering, you know, the, the, the lights that we're so fond of these days that really do work incredibly well. We have them on State Street. We're thinking the, um, for, of them for Cabrillo. Uh, they're the ones where a pedestrian walks up and hits it, and then within, I don't know, a matter of seconds, it turns green for a limited amount of time. People cross, traffic stops, and you continue with your life. Is that at all feasible in any way, shape, or form for that? I know it's not that far off the curb, but I don't know. The and difficulty with putting a mid-block uh, pedestrian crossing here with a, with a light is we'll have real difficulty with the synchronization along that street because of the short distance between, in essence, those three signals yeah. along that section. Well, aren't you so we, thinking of staggering them anyway to slow traffic down? Didn't I hear that? I sure hope not. We want to keep mm -hmm. the flow down Anacapa Street as much as we can. We have some difficulties because we want the north-south flow. And so we're trying to solve our difficulties when we, when we get to the major uh, east-west corridor, such as Carrillo Street to try and keep the flow there. So if we add one into the mid-block here, we have real capacity and efficiency problems at that stage. And I'm not entirely convinced that helping the pedestrians there will assist with the exiting of the vehicles. In fact, it may make that problem worse in it some cases. depends on which side you put it on. If you put it on the upside, it'll help it. Well, it depends on how it's timed as well, because yeah. we may not ever get platooning traffic, so we may not get people out that exit. So it might help in that way. They all have to go out the other one. <laughs> but the bottom line is, is I think there is the solution if we're using the two feet on the county yeah. side, but bringing it all the way down to the intersection, you will then retain the parking from that point, retain those trees. Uh, I don't think it will reduce the cost all that much, but then you can also do, as was shown in the design drawings for the Granada Garage, it sort of, I'll call it protected exit, but there is the ability to do some channelization at that point to give the motorists the opportunity to at least get out and then make their maneuver as they see fit. Okay. Mr. Horton. I uh, came thinking that doing nothing was the best solution, but after hearing the testimony and talking to some folks, I, I now have changed my mind, and I think we need to do something. And, and I think that taking out the parking on a temporary basis um, is where I would go. Um, but I think we can solve the problem that Ms. Falcone raises in terms of, of not having a second step by, by whatever motion is made tonight. Uh, there's a couple of options uh, after taking out that parking on a temporary basis that I could go with, Planning Commission option being one of them. Uh, another thing that troubles me is that we've had sort of a, a very vague idea about how to fund this stuff from a financial standpoint. And, Again, I have to keep saying as Chair of Finance, I've got to know how you're going to pay for this stuff before I vote for it. I can't, I just can't give you a blank check here, uh, not with uh, what, what I know of the situation. And, and I'm not really sure how much this could run up, but I think it could run up to several hundred thousand dollars, if not more, depending on what solution we take. So I'm prepared to make a temporary decision tonight and to um, get some more information on uh, the secondary impacts and, and then revisit this thing uh, when we have some good solid numbers to go with. 
Yeah, thanks. Ms. Schneider? Thank you. For what it's worth, yesterday morning I parked into the garage just to go to Coffee Cat and then left afterwards. So, um, And it was fine, and I parked by the exit near Coffee Cat, and it was pleasant. Um, I've been in other times when it's been difficult to exit, and uh, mm -hmm. so I've experienced that as well, um, even when the garage isn't very full, but just with a few cars in the queue lane. So obviously there seems to be an issue there that will change over time with both that exits open but um that has been my experience as well i um i i'm looking at the finances as well uh, the, a lot of the options here w can go up to what we have in the staff report up to two hundred and thirty eight thousand dollars and i'm thinking back to our um, enhanced transit conversations where how much time and energy was spent trying to find some money from various downtown parking programs, Measure D, whatever, just to help with enhanced transit. And by automatically going into something that's going to cost $238,000, when we could work with the timing of the slurry seal to see what happens and check it out that way by, I guess that's option five for now, um, I, I, I think it's, it's spending money too soon on a project that's already cost a whole lot. And there was, uh, there's also been issues with the whole parking rates of the reserves amount in the downtown parking fund needed to maintain the other garages and not, you know, to keep that preventative maintenance up. Not to mention who knows what happens with Measure D and uh, if we have to reallocate funds for enhanced transit, where is that going to come from? Right. So there's a lot of funding issues here that really hasn't been talked about uh, to date um, today, and, and I think we have to bear that in mind. So I am, uh, and, and then on top of that, there's been so much construction in this area. I think we need a breather uh, a little bit. And, you know, I know the, the theater is still going on in the back, and um, that will continue, but to spend some more time dealing with curbs and whatnot after all this time with the construction on Anacapa Street, uh, I think we need a little bit of a breather there. So in terms of doing nothing, it doesn't make sense because we're about to restripe the road. And so if we're going to restripe it, we should restripe it in a way that makes sense at least on a short-term basis. And so where I'm leaning to is, is um, I understand the concern about removing the parking on the east side, but for the reason I just mentioned, I think that's the first step we should do, restripe it that way, have a full lane, a uh, full turning lane for the entrance and exiting for the garage. And uh, if it becomes a big problem, we can always come back and look at recurbing or landscaping or saving trees or all those other things. But to decide right now on an item of up to $238,000 when some other funding issues are still up in the air in the next few months, I think is a little, um, it's too soon to, to do that. So uh, I guess I've heard that looking at option five, restripe, see what happens, and if necessary, we can come back, but that's where I'm, that's where I'm standing right now. Okay. And some people are saying explore uh, option four when you're saying if necessary, come back, but looking at the east side of the street. I, I understand. Yeah, I guess I, I appreciate yeah. the comments about um, uh, having a landscape parkway on mm -hmm. the eastern side without the cars there will be helpful to the pedestrians, I yeah. think. Um, again, you know, it's it's a funding issue right now. I want to see how, how okay. what happens first. Okay. Sorry. Okay, and also the, well, I don't mean, I'm not raining on your parade here, but the that parkway on the western side also is not it's not uh, landscaped yet, uh, for a good reason. But there is a, it is a buffer, and I think it is a buffer. Right. But I mean, when we get some landscaping in there, it'll be more of a feeling of a buffer. Anyway, I just, um, Mr. Williams. Well, this is going to be tough because I. It is tough. Thus far, I, I I think I hear five from council members and five <laughs> different opinions. So. Um, uh, I, you know, and I came in here um, to this meeting with a different idea, um, uh, but I, I definitely, uh, particularly hearing from from Eric and uh, Krista, um, I think we might need to to do something a little bit different. Um, and I, um, but what I what I've been hearing from uh, Tully as this conversation has evolved is that Tully seems to be putting together some sort of hybrid idea here. Um, and and I want to I want to see if I can if you if put some parameters around it and if you you know can can do it. Um, I'm wondering if um, uh, if you can restripe 
um, you, sort of using some restriping and um, maybe some um, uh, loss of curbing on the east side for part of the block, if you could create a right-hand turn lane, um, keep the mature trees, um, if you have the sort of $150,000 and the freedom to eliminate one or two parking spots, can you, can you do it? Can you keep the rest of the parking? Can you create the lane? We really don't know. We would have to explore this further. We need to get together with engineering. One thing that we did discuss with the downtown parking committee at the meeting in August was, you know, a modified recommendation number two, basically creating a um, parking pocket, if you will. That would make, we're not sure how many parking spaces that will because we know we we can't have parking all the way to Annapamu Street. We want to try and save the mature trees on the north end of the driveway, but I don't know how much that's going to cost. Engineering has not cost that out. Yeah. We're not sure if it's 100% feasible. We would have to explore that further, and we were more than willing to do that, but we haven't explored that in detail. I think we have some conflicting values here, and I think uh, Mr. Williams is right that there's a lot of imperfect options, but Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to see if uh, staff could put together a proposal if we give them a little bit of breathing room. We give them a little bit of ability to play with the, the eastern curb. Um, we um, we want to keep those mature trees. We want to keep um, most of the parking. I heard that one or two spots might be really the problems. Um, and um, so I'm going to, I'll make it a motion to ask staff uh, to bring us back um, a, an, an option that, that um, uh, creates a right-hand turn lane, um, um, restripes for as cheap as possible, um, and keeps our mature trees and eliminates no more than two sp parking spots. Is that possible? <laughs> I don't I understand how the, that could I be heard possible. The, the, I they heard said the, they would the have to look that, into it. I heard the, the, the staff moving towards it, but maybe I'm imagining something. I, I also I, thought Grant wanted to make the motion. Oh, well, I, I, I heard well, things Brian evolving a little yet, bit uh, between I haven't uh, talked yet. then and now. Um, uh, you guys used to get down on me for always for, for jumping and making a motion the no, first thing. No, but I thing. just don't know um, if it's a feasible <laughs> I, motion. Well, I believe okay. that... Um, that we are creating some um, uh, that in in separating the all these seven options there are pieces here that can work together I, I heard that from the very beginning when Tully said we might be even be able to just solve the whole problem by eliminating one or two parking spots and restriping um, I'd like this to be solved for the least amount of money but also not lose the majority of parking there or lose the trees I want to see if it's possible okay is there a second to your motion no. Okay. Mr. Barnwell. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. No one has mentioned the bicycle yeah. center. Um, if the lanes are 10 feet in width, if, uh, if, we, if we remove the parking on the county admin side, and we have plus or minus, what is it, 36 feet of width there for the entire run, and we have 10-foot lanes, which are kind of a standard width for lanes, then that gives us six feet to play around with for bicycles. Um, some of the converse, and I'm not suggesting that we put in a bicycle lane, but what I am suggesting is that, the, for me, the tail is wagging the dog here, and it is those cars parked at the curb. I wish we could rewind to about seven years ago when everybody in that part of town, how many cars do we park in the new lot? 540? 570. 570. That's correct. And the cost of the lot was 22 million? Yes. Round numbers? Yes, roughly 22 million. I, I just want to also clear something up here. Well, you've got the bike station and you've The got value of the parking ahead. stalls is not $60,000 or $90,000. It's $38,000 mm -hmm. for the ones that are in the building. If you take 22 million, if you. I'm just talking about building that garage right there, building that garage, that cost. I all, we, we created 570 new spaces. Now, we had, oh, what, 210? What was the number that we had before? He's getting to it. 210, right? <laughs> so we've created 360 <laughs> new spaces. Yeah. And believe me, seven years ago, that was 
incredibly important that we get those new spaces. And now we're suggesting that they're unusable. <laughs> that people who want to go see to the county administration can't go into the parking lot and use the new spaces. Now, I admit that there may be some casual benefit to getting into the coffee cat, but I go into the coffee cat all the time, and I'm really glad the garage is there now because it's always hard to find a parking space to get into the coffee cat, whether there or in front on the Annapamu side. So I find the garage a real benefit to the community. I don't find it a detriment, and I think that the concerns there may be a little bit exaggerated, but I think over time people are going to start using that garage which I think is going to eliminate the discussion of whether or not we need those 12 or 13 spaces. The building manager of the county admin building would, has anecdotally told me that he would like to get rid of those because of 9-11 concerns. Yeah. He hasn't come out publicly and said that because they don't want to scare anybody. But in the same no, way that we has. don't allow parking in front of the federal bankruptcy court, <laughs> we'll scare everybody, um, he, he would just as soon not have that parking there. So when for me, and then... I think Mr. Mr. Um, Horton and Ms. Schneider, and, and to a degree Mr. Williams, are right on target when they talk about the cost of moving the curb. Um, the Planning Commission decision says if cost is not an issue, yeah. move the curb. I don't know when cost isn't an issue. Cost is always an issue. I think Ms. Schneider's point is excellent that there are alternative ways to spend that money rather than moving that curb. And if we move the curb, I don't know what the engineers are going to say, but moving the curb two feet or one feet or four feet <laughs> probably is not going to make that much of a difference. Once you cut that sucker and you start knocking down trees, whether you go two feet or three or four and whatever in the heck is lying underneath that sidewalk there that we have to deal with, I, I think we could be in a bottomless pit of expenses. So I, I'm I'm strongly leaning in the direction of the of the... I think Mr. Rose's comments may be where I would like to go, which is restripe it, get rid of the parking, restripe it, and then come back, as has been suggested here before, and let's look at the dollar amount. And then at that point, we make a decision. If this dollar amount is huge, if it's three or $400,000, we just don't do it because we have other places to spend that money. And as we all remember, alternative transportation was a big issue in the formation of this garage. So if we have 300000 extra dollars, there's a lot of alternative transportation issues that we may be able to target that at. So I'm, I'm very much in favor, and I think Madam Mayor points it out very well. Um, the the so tight, attempting to parallel park on the left-hand side is kind of weird. I've already experienced that myself several times. I think Mr. Horton is exactly correct when he talks about the exiting and Mr. Rose talking about the exiting. It is very important that we create that protective yeah. lane. So um, I, for, for me, it's, it's quite a simple solution. The cost is almost minimal to eliminate the parking, restripe the boulevard, go back and do some cost studies and find out what it actually is, and then at some later point make the decision of whether or not we really want to cut into the curb. Um, anyway, thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> I want to give the parking um, folks some credit, too, because uh, as I exited that garage, we've all tried out the garage to see what's happening. Um, as I was exiting, um, there is a, um, and I don't know what you call it, a place to put your ticket if it's less than 75 minutes before the kiosk. And that moves, and I had somebody in front of me trying to pay into the kiosk, and I could just do that. And so when you go to Coffee Cat, get your coffee, you can st do that and still leave pretty quickly. So that's um, that's a good thing that we've done. I don't, I haven't seen that in any other garages. Um, I'm I'm very interested in just removing the parking and then we'll work on it and I, I you know we'll get some landscaping and maybe something can happen over there with either the palm trees or mature trees or or not but either way um, it's the cheapest way to go right now and I'm not trying to do the cheapest but for right now it's a good way to go too and I know it's all difficult I agree with Mr. Williams um, he, he was right right on but that's why they pay us the huge bucks up here and that's why we're here at six o'clock at night well, madam mayor mr house let me uh there was a question uh, or two raised about the money and i just think we yeah. can ask these questions right now how did you plan on paying for this in the first place i mean this has been going on for several months and it's gone by different committees and what we're and it is sort of remediating a mistake that was made so what's the plan for the capital cost of this project most likely we would pay for it out of the downtown parking program reserve funds so it wouldn't come out of the other the other capital funds that we have. It comes out of the downtown parking re reserve funds, Correct. and that was established just recently when we put that uh, 
when we put that reserve together out of the increased parking yeah. fee. Am and I we correct? Put, it, put together methodology to start building the reserve fund, correct? I got it. And estimated cost of something like uh, what Planning Commission was talking about, but retaining those uh, mature trees, you gave us some kind of a number, but did you actually study that? And, and w did you come up with a 200 and some thousand dollar number? Block Tree Design came up with a number of uh, the high end of $238,000, and I believe that one was for taking the curb on the county side and moving it in four feet towards the center line, relocating the curb on the county side all the way from Manapamu Street to Victoria Street is a $170,000 range. But you know, those are guesstimates because they haven't really done really detailed engineering studies, so those are estimates. And I. I am cautious to say, hey, this is the absolute number that we can use to, okay. to to do this work. I would want engineering to really put their pen to paper and really do some serious uh, analysis before we say how much it's really going to cost. Okay, but would it, then my my last question on that is, if we were at a in a phased approach, were to take this uh, current slurry seal opportunity to restrike, which means we would lose those parking spaces and come back at a future time where you would actually have the cost estimates really refined for doing the kind of hybrid thing that I heard talked about here a couple of, by a couple of people and that I could support. Um, uh, where would that money still, would, it, would you still be looking for the funds from the same place or would it be the next year capital, next time we do another capital program in the future or how would that work? Well, that's something mm -hmm. I'll have to talk to, uh, you know, Tony Nishich about and, and staff and you know, initially I'm, I'm thinking we'd probably take, take it out of the downtown parking fund. Because there's a direct nexus to the parking garage yeah. itself, right? Correct. You know, our streets capital program uh, dollar uh, are starting to you know, get mm -hmm. a little tight, so we're looking yeah. at the most appropriate place to pay for it. And, you know, so we need to come up with a real hard number that we feel confident coming back to the council with and All we'll right. identify a funding source at that point. Okay, I think you're really helping us answer this. I move that we uh, take a phased approach to this. We initially do a restriping of the street. What was the number of the option that we're number talking six, about here? Number six, I think that, I mean five. Five. Right? Yeah, five. Number five, but also that this come back to City Council with refined numbers and an engineering plan to do a, a hybrid that retains the um, the mature trees and then follows through with the rest of the Planning Commission's recommendation. Okay, that sounds second. good to me. Okay, we've got several seconds. That's good. Uh, Madam, I'll, Madam Mayor? Yes. Madam Mayor, I just want to make understand the direction. Message. What we were thinking of doing this option which is our recommendation, is we would come back as part of next year's budget and yeah. do this. Now, if you want it sooner, we could certainly do it sooner or oh. whatever. But because you know, the council will look at a prioritization of, of a lot of stuff for two years in our in our next six years capital and, and but our that operating discussion budget. will start in, in, right after the first of the year, probably very we'll soon. Whenever we can. But we would um, be back in front of you in the context of that whole budget, which is right, right. after January. So I didn't want to. You have a different expectation. No, I think that's now. okay. We're we're far yeah. enough along at the end of the year to be pushing it through the holidays. But at least we can get something on the ground now that would be a benefit. And then, but as long as we know it's coming back as part of that, okay. I think that's a, the most important thing. And, and everybody just, has to go to the coffee cap. <laughs> and just to clarify, I, I want to make and sure. And booked in. Because there, I want to clarify, yeah. do you want us to design it, or do you want us to get you better conceptual numbers that are much more than a, that are better than a guesstimate? Because we could, we it would probably cost us twenty or thirty thousand dollars to, yeah, to, go ahead to and design, design it. to do a construction design. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I, or do you want us to come more with, a, I guess, a better range of numbers, and then you can decide if you want. We to need the forward. information to make an informed decision, which we can't do today. So okay. you can maybe work together with, uh, with us on what that would take. I'm not asking you to design it. I'm asking mm -hmm. in this motion for you to come back with the numbers for us to make a good decision. Okay. But I think there's an intent established here with this that we would like to see something accomplished. I, 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 I'm making this motion with the intention that we that we move forward with that if feasible. Right. right, or not, right. depending that upon cost. Or not. Something. That's right. my point. That, that decision is made later, yeah. Right. Yeah, Thank the you. if feasible takes care of that. Okay. I'll, yes. I have, a, I have a question, just a clarifying question. So if I understand your motion, you're saying to go ahead and um, do the slur seal and all that fun stuff, take the t parking away temporarily. Or not. And then. It might be permanent. And then to, that's where I'm going, and then to come back during the budget process, which begins in March. January. 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 Well, January, but okay. So in January. So when, I guess I'm looking for a place in time, a real place in time, if it's January or March, mm -hmm. um, where we are going to have uh, Mr. Clifford and Mr. Allen and whoever else who have put pencil to paper to actually come up with this hybrid notion that I think I heard a number of people um, talking about 
that would then give us the opportunity to discuss whether or not the parking will ever come back because i believe strongly that if the parking goes away it will never come back and i would can only vote for this motion if i know of a certain period a point in time when that is going to come back and if i hear january then i can probably support it but it's not going to be January. You're if not, we wait yeah. for the budget process, that's, that's the problem. I've been told the budget and, and process began in January. Right. It begins in January, but we can't spend any money until July, until the budget's yeah. approved, if it's part of the budget process. And and I I, I, I just have to say, I, I think the those businesses down there have had a trouble for long enough with all this construction. If we can do this before next year's budget, we should do it before next year's budget. But they don't want the parking going away either. So if we're going to have this conversation, I want to know when it's going to happen, when we are going to talk about the parking and the numbers. Because the budget, I'm very uncomfortable with the numbers and the budget and what I didn't see in here. So I'm glad that all this was, you know, made a focal point. But really, I want to know a point in time when staff is going to bring this back to us, and I want that to be, you know, really on the record tonight. Otherwise, okay. I can't Mr. support Armstrong? this. Yeah, Madam Mayor, I've been talking with the public or staff. Sure. What we would intend to do is come back to you no later than sometime during the month of January with much better cost estimates as to what it would take. And then if it works into the budget process, fine. But we, we would also at that point give you the ability to say, yes, we want to go forward and no, and then we could go forward a little more quickly. And, okay. and, Thank you. And at that point, hopefully the businesses in that area, not just these two, but in the surrounding area, will have um, some sort of indication as to whether or not those parking spaces are of value and, and, uh, and, and how much, or quantify it in some way. For my okay. fellow um, uh, city Mr. council House. folks, the reason that I, I think of this as so very important is I do tie this with a pedestrian master plan. Mm -hmm. I do tie it with good quality urban design right. and removing parking spaces from there, set aside the value of them as parking spaces, um, would really be a detriment to the pedestrian environment. And I, I just really want you all to know I'm very sincere and earnest in hoping to see this come back and be fulfilled. So, but right. clearly the door's open. I think we're all in, this, in that um, frame of mind, and so is the staff. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Well, it turned out unanimous. Real simple, huh? Okay, we've got um, four other things on our agenda. May I have a motion to continue those? So moved. Second. Second. Do we need to, a specific date to continue them, too? Okay. Uh, there's a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Then we are adjourned. See, your day was better than you thought it was going to be, Susan.